शुरू हलो कि बांगलेश in a very lively webinar that is going to cover uh, current topics so in the beginning i would like to start with honoring the covid frontliners the covid warriors and the covid survivors goto der bochore amra onek ke hariyechi onek doctor hariyechi onek sajon ke hariyechi onek bondhu ke hariyechi tader shobai ke shoron korte chai amaderi majhe खजा नाजिमुद्दीन प्रफेसर उन्नी सिनियर फ्रम मेडिकल कलेज उना के हारिए आत्मार रूहर माग फिर कमना करते चाहिए उ हैड एन इनक्रेडिबल जार्नि इन द लास्ट इयर एंड हाफ एट द सेम टाइम बांगलेश हेज वेलकाम एंड इट हेज शोन दैट there is a power of working together we have struggled but we were never alone so I, today we have a huge lineup of speakers and i would like to start with introducing myself i i am dr aisha sigter i am the lead physician in pulmonary critical care in planetary health association group i would like to start, thank planetary health associate for actually bringing us together for giving us such a tremendous opportunity um to be together and have such world class lectures available to frontliners i would like to welcome our audience um please feel free to stop and ask any questions let me share the screen so as you can see we have six distinguished panelists and followed by tremendous speakers six of them So the first panelist is Professor Shahira Khatun Bela. She is the former head of the department of Dhaka Medical College Anesthesia Analgesia and Intensive Care Medicine. Bela Appa is also the president of Bangladesh Critical Care Medicine. We are very honored to have you Appa. Um Appa has is not just renowned she has had tremendous contribution to the field of critical care in bangladesh and is always engaged always available apa is also a poet apa sathe ashole kotha bolte samne amar ektu bhoy lage thank you so much apa for your valuable time and for being present today you are the ornament of today's webinar We also have Professor Titumia, who is the professor of medicine and principal of Dhaka Medical College. Professor Titumia is a renowned physician in the field of medicine, and he is actually a, a syndicate member, and he is a member of many policy um, making during COVID, and also the super infection with COVID in Bangladesh. in our faculty us faculty we have tremendous faculty dr mohammad hamidu zaman who is the director of medical icu at brookdale university hospital professor dr hamidu zaman is one of the pioneers of critical care and pulmonology in the 
Bangladesh Medical Association North America Pulmonary Critical Care Group. Unni shabar aage eshe chen, kintu unna shakho shab jai gaye. Hamid bhai ke amra follow kori. Hamid bhai not only is an authoritative voice, he was one of the star students of his class when I was in medical school. We have Dr. Tazbirul Islam. I'm so proud of Tazbir, I'm so proud. Tazbir Amadeh Shabar Jr. Um, he's the chairman of PHA. He's the clinical associate professor of Indiana University School of Medicine. Amar mone hai Bangladesh ami joto bar gachi beshir bhag shomai Tazbir Amar shati chilo. And we had, we had so much fun together and we had so many educational workshops together. Joto khon she jege thake, ebun jau ghumate jau arage Tazbir er ektai chinta che Bangladesh e ki kora chai. Tazbir, thank you. Tumi amate shabai ke akshate kore chho. Ebun tumi, now you stand as president of, or chairman of Planetary Health Associate. In the panelist is Dr. Shamsi Tabriz. Tabriz also is junior to us, but he is an infectious disease icon now in our um, Bangladeshi uh, physician group. Is, uh, Tabriz is clinical associate professor of medicine at University of Illinois in Chicago. She prothom theke amra jokhon COVID er niye kaj korchi Bangladesh er sathe tokhon thekei Tabriz kintu otoproto bhabe jorito and we actually respect his opinion tremendously. In our panelist is Dr. Raihan Rappani. Everybody knows Raihan. Raihan is very popular. He is an instrumental in management of COVID and he's a consultant in ICU and internal medicine at Square Hospital. Raihan Amadeh Shathe Bhishon Bhabi Jorito, Amra Jokhan Bangladesh Jai. And we are really proud of your achievement in Bangladesh. We are so proud of our juniors in Bangladesh who are in the faculty and who are now uh, such well established in their own, own field. <laughs> and Dr. Abu Sayed uh, Firoz. Both of them are speaker, but I have requested them to be panelists as well, because they are so renowned and their input is so valuable. Dr. Abu Sayed Firoz is the next speaker. Um, Dr. Habibur Rahman Lulu is a clinical assistant professor at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. He's a specialist in pulmonology, critical care, and he's also trained in anesthesiology, a rare combination. But Dr. Lulu is known as the legend of my class. In my class under Dhaka University, four major medical colleges, he was the top student. Ajopor Junto, Amadir Keu Oshusto Hole, Amra Kintu Lulu Ke Jigesh Kori. And I'm so proud of you, brother. Thank you so much, Dr. Habibur Rahman. He's a scholarly speaker. He's absolutely a prolific speaker. Thank you for joining us. Our first speaker and also to be panelist is Dr. Abu Said Firoz. Firoz Pai, during his time in medical college, when he just amatike dui bachur senior Dhaka Medical College, he was also the top student of his class. In Firuz Bhai ki bole sheta kintu amra shunte chaita. He is known as the sepsis guru of United States. And Firuz Bhai is going to talk on sepsis today. So let me go over the agenda today. The segment one panelist will be Professor Shahira Khatun Bela, Dr. Habibur Rahman Lulu, Dr. Tazbirul Islam, and Dr. Muhammad Tabriz. We will this speaker, first speaker, Dr. Firoz, will talk about trends and controversies of sepsis. This will be followed by two fascinating topics by uh, two other prolific speakers. I will introduce them as I go along. Dr. Fatima Ahmed, 
will talk about antimicrobial associated harm in critical care. Dr. Kanis Fatima will talk on antimicrobial stewardship in the ICU. The second group, segment two panelists will be Professor Titu Mia, Dr. Hamid Dulsaman and Dr. Raihan Rabbani. And the two speakers will join, including Dr. Tazbirul Islam as panelist. The first speaker is Dr. Tariq Reza, a very exciting topic on mucormycosis or the black fungus, so-called, the fungal super infection, the Bangladeshi experience. Amra opekha korchi kotha ti, tomar kotha shunte. Dr. Lunik Shargar from UK will join and talk on shock, initial shock management in the emergency department, very important topic. And the last, but the most important speaker is Dr. Habibur Rahman, who's going to talk about super infection in the ICU. So I'm going to go on to introduce Dr. Abu Said Firoz. Um, Dr. Abu Said Firoz is going to talk on sepsis, trends, and controversies. Firoz Pai has worked on sepsis for the past, past 25 to 30 years. On a lecture, Amra Mantra Mugtho He Shuni, Dui Ghanta Dhore. So he's going to give us a quick rundown. Firuz Pai, please. Thank you so much. Firuz Pai, we can see your slides. Kintu apna ke shona jab chena. Firuz Pai, apne unmute koren. Mahbub, um, unmute Please unmute yourself, sir. Um, mute button ta... Can you oh. hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Go okay. Up, Thank you. Thank you very much. The time is short and I'll move on fast. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to be with you this morning. And I thank all of you and the uh, uh, organizers for giving me the opportunity to, to speak. I think among the speakers and the panels that we have, I think I have one contemporary, Dr. Hamid Zaman. He's a year senior to me, but I, I, I consider him as a contemporary. The rest of you are all younger to me, but we can reassure you that I took my critical care boards for the fourth time in April and I'm up to date and I passed, you know. So I have no conflict of interest. The presentation today is based on my understanding of the current literature in sepsis and septic shock. And all physicians should use their knowledge, judgment, and guidelines provided by the different critical care society and you know, use the treatment. Uh, how, uh, this is the place where I've been working for the last uh, 30, 32 years uh, at Lee Health System in Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, Aisha has uh, given me the Herculean task of moving outside the box, not just talking about the guidelines, but thinking outside the guidelines about the controversies in sepsis. And there's a lot to talk about, so I'm going to move very fast. Uh, the first is the sepsis definition. You know, what are the controversies in that? We all know in 1991, the Society of Critical Care Medicine and European Society of Intensive Care Medicine came with a diagnosis of sepsis using the SERS criteria, and they defined sepsis using two SERS criteria and the presence of infection. Nothing happened in the next 10 years when sepsis two was redefined and using the same SERS criteria and further, you know, se severe sepsis associated with organ dysfunction and septic shock needing vasopressors were redefined. Again, 15 years went by and there was a dramatic shift in the thinking of sepsis, abandoning the SERS criteria and using the SOFA criteria for the first time, the sequential organ failure assessment and the sepsis three was reintroduced with the concept of sepsis pathobiology and organ dysfunction which stirred a lot of controversy. 
And since the topic is controversy and disruption shock, we need to talk a little bit about it. What happened as we moved on from leaving the source criteria to the SOFOC criteria, we lost our sensitivity and we increased our specificity. So you saw a lot of articles coming out, a lot of, of letters to the editor coming out. Why are we abandoning SIRS? We know that sepsis is a time dependent, like trauma, like acute MI, like stroke. And if you don't treat the sepsis in time, you lose ground, you go from a regulated response to a dysregulated response, which cannot be treated. We do know that when you use the source criteria, you use a lot of you know, non-infectious conditions which will trigger like pancreatitis, burns. And as you moved on to the sofa, we waited too long for the organ dysfunction to come in and we lost the sensitivity. So then came a compromise. Uh, I don't know whether you can see my slides. We came up with something called NEWS. Uh, is a national early war warning system, which was basically derived from MUSE, M-E-W-S, which was developed in the surgical ICU about 30 years ago in the United States. So the national health system in the United Kingdom, based on the MUSE model, chose news uh, uh, that's the national early warning system, to achieve a compromise of increasing, keeping the sensitivity and also the specificity and achieving a midline. At different institutions in the United States, you know, they follow the different guidelines. At all institutions, we use a news of five. And I'll talk to you a little bit about news if I get time. The next concept and controversy is, is this septic shock a hypovolemic shock or is it a distributive or vasodilatory shock? You know, for the last 30 years after the study, landmark study of many rivers from uh, Detroit, the early goal-directed therapy or sepsis, it is ingrained in our brain about the 30 cc's per kilogram, you know, resuscitation of sepsis. Are we telling that this is a hypovolemic shock or what percentage of the septic shock is hypovolemic and what percentage of the septic shock is a distributory or vasodilatory shock? Uh, now understand that we have not lost any blood volume. It is just the tank, which for example was five liters has now expanded to 10 liters. And of course the volume is low and we just filled up the tank with a more five liters of fluid to make it 10. And having done that in our practice in the last 35 years in the ICU, how many times did you see peripheral gangrene from vasodilators? And how many times have you seen a blown up patient with volume overload? And as you know, the 10% of the patient in the intensive care unit, intensive care unit are volume overloaded. So there has been a paradigm shift. And I think in the next five years, we are, you are going to see, as we move on, you are going to see the vaso pressures being introduced earlier. If you go to the mean arterial pressure, which is a measurement of cardiac output and stroke vascular, systemic vascular resistance, and to that you have to add the CVP. Understand we have been taught too much and emphasis have been placed on the forward or uh, driving pressure, but we not much have been talked about the back pressure, which is the CVP and the interstitial fluid pressure. So the tissue perfusion is not only dependent on the mean arterial pressure, but a vital role of the central venous pressure and the interstitial fluid pressure, depending on the flow, resistance and uh, pressures have been taught about. I'll tell you if the CVP pressure is normally in septic shock is almost zero. So what happens, the mean arterial pressure is the driving force for the tissue perfusion. And we know that the system with vascular resistance is low. Now imagine when you have volume, you filled up that five liter with 10 liters of fluid, what happens to your CVP? Maybe your CVP is 14 now. So you have to subtract that number 14 from the mean arterial pressure. And of course the tissue perfusion gets tremendously affected when your backward pressure, the central venous pressure, or interstitial fluid pressure increases. Moving on a little bit about uh, to the cytokines and, and uh, uh, you know, different uh, nitric oxide and all. Now what happens in septic shock? What happens to your nitric oxide level in the blood? Uh, if you take endothelial cells and uh, in a laboratory model and put endotoxins in the endothelial cells, 
and you measure the nitric oxide synthetase uh, synthet level, it is tremendously high. So in septic shock, the nitric oxide level is extremely high. The prostacyclin vasodilators go high. Now, once this happens, you have a tremendous amount of vasodilatation and perfusion gets affected because of the drop in the systemic vas vascular resistance. Now, the intention was, you know, for dropping the, uh, causing the vasodilatation is to increase the blood flow to the tissue, but it goes overboard and ultimately the tissues do not get enough uh, perfusion. Now, think about the hormones there, what happens to the vas arginine vasopressin is a hormone which is liberated in the blood based on Barrow's receptor concept. And once you get the vasodilatation, the arginine vasopressin level decreases. And we know in septic shock, the vasopressin level is very low. What happens to your angiotensin converting enzyme? In herbs with sepsis, you don't have S at all. As a result, the angiotensin one is not converted to angiotensin two. Now, Having to, told all this, we have to now move on to understand that we have to talk about the backward pressure, which will be talked about more in the next five years. We have to talk more about you know, the vasopressin. We more have to talk about the angiotensin too. Now, moving on to the third thing is the fluid versus early vasopressors. There are more and more studies coming out. I quoted one for you that the early use of vasopressors is going to happen you know, in the septic shock. Now, one problem has been you know, about putting central lines. It is not necessary to put a central line if you are using low vasodilators. We have to move away from our old you know, teaching that you have to give 30 mLs per kg. That was based on the concept of hypovolemic shock or low volume in a, filling up a 10 liter tank with more fluid and not you know, going forward to remove that fluid. 10% of the patients in the intensive care unit are hypovolemic, and that is that associated with increased mortality. The next topic I won't touch because it was discussed in the last session about the hemodynamic monitoring. Clearly, static is fallen into distributed static pressure monitoring. We have now moved over to dynamic pressure monitoring, and majority of the patients with septic shock, if you put the central venous catheter, will be in a pressure between four and 16 centimeters of, uh, you know, four and 16. So below four, you know, you're hypovolemic, above 16, you're hypovolemic. But what do you do when you are between four and 16? Obviously the dynamic pressure is more reliable in calculating the amount of intervascular fluid requirement. So having the dynamic pressure in hand, why are we compelled to give 30 mLs per kg? I think we should move away from that use vasopressors early and move on to dynamic pressure monitoring. Next controversy is the fluid resuscitation. We all know the CEPH study. We all know the Voluven study. And we clearly know that crystalloids are preferred over colloids. The only time you want to use albumin when you are a patient is in shock with uh, cirrhosis of the liver, when you have spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, those are the only situations where colloid has been used. We have moved on from what's called a balanced and unbalanced fluid now. You know, over the last 30 years, we use normal saline as a resuscitative fluid, and we know that chloride is pro-inflammatory. It releases cytokines. It called the, the vascular tree senses chloride hyperchloremia as hypervolemia. What I mean that you may be hypervolemic, but if your chloride level is 120, the juxtaglomerular cells in the kidney will sense that you are hypervolemic. So what happens, the afferent arterioles in the kidneys are shut off and the, you get renal hyperperfusion and you get acute kidney injury. We'll talk a little bit more if you have time. Now, early antibiotics and fluids. We all know that early antibiotics are key from the study of Anand Kumar several decades ago that if you don't give the correct antibiotics in the first hour of sepsis, you know, it is associated with the eightfold increase in mortality and the fluids also come in. And these are all still counted in the, in the three and six hour bundles. Uh, but I think we have, what we need to do, we have to move away from that massive fluid resuscitation to early vasopressor model. And I think that's going to happen in the next five years. Now, the question, next controversy is the vasopressors. 
catecholamines versus not catecholamines, you know. So all these years, you know, we have learned that the catecholamines are the, you know, vasopressors of choice. Uh, now, having gone, going back to what happens to the nitric oxide level, the prostacyclin vasodilators, the arginine vasopressin, angiotensin converting enzymes, and angiotensin two, we have to move away from our dogma about using catecholamines as the as the major vasopressors during septic shock. Now, you all have to know this one study is the VAS study by uh, uh, the VAS study was done earlier using vasopressin with norepinephrine. Uh, then, then, then Daniel DeBecker has shown that norepinephrine is the vasopressor of choice, both in cardiogenic and septic shock, based on the increased mortality related to cardiac arrhythmia. And also we need to know about the ATHOS-3 trial about the role of angiotensin II. The angiotensin II is a God-given vasopressor in your body. The reason why it is low in septic shock, because when you get septic shock and ARDS, you don't have angiotensin converting enzyme in your body. And as a result, the angiotensin one is not converted to angiotensin II. Uh, so we have to think about this. And we have seen in the ICU about the new onset atrial fibrillation. It's called the NOAA. NOAF, and it happens very frequently in the intensive care unit in, in, in a lot of septic and septic shock patients. And the use of catecholamines, electrolyte imbalance have been associated with the new onset atrial fibrillation. Once you get the new onset atrial fibrillation, you know, your outcome is poor. You know, you're more risk of staying longer in the hospital. You are more likely to get a stroke and the long-term thing is not done. And this is more associated with the use of catecholamines. There have been several studies now showing that when you use the vasopressin earlier and lower the use of catecholamine, you may prevent the development of new onset atrial fibrillation. Moving on to corticosteroid controversy, you know, Aran is the one who did the majority of the study in corticosteroid, uh, you know, uh, from France. And he pub first published in 2002, again in 2018, and then the cortical study by Jim Sprung in 2008 and the Aprocus study. So the bottom line, you know, some of you may believe or not in the CIRCI, critical care illness related corticosteroid insufficiency. We do not do any corticosteroid, you know, corticosteroid stimulation test. In general, when you are vasopressor dependent and you have not been able to win the vasopressor after fluid resuscitation, there is a role of corticosteroids. We use hydrocortison, uh, uh, 50 milligrams Q6 hourly times uh, uh, seven days. So if you get a chance, we'll discuss more about that. I know this is a short talk. Moving on from the landmark early goal directed therapy for sepsis with many rivers and to the usual care, the process, the promise and arise trial. We know now that the usual uh, care is as good as the goal directed therapy for sepsis. But two things stood out in this. I think the usual care, they all got their basic you know, uh, treatment from many rivers where they resuscitated the patient with peripheral lights with the early IV fluids and early antibiotics. So we have now really moved on from early goal directed therapy for sepsis to the usual care. And Jones, when he published his article in JAMA in 2010, also showed us he had a group of 300 patients. Half of them had monitoring of the central venous oxygen saturation and half of them had lack serial lactate, you know, followed, and serial lactate following is as good as monitoring this CBO2. Moving on to the glucose uh, controversy, you know, we all know the landmark study by Vandenberg, Vandenberg in a group of cabbage patients in the surgical ICU, where she clearly showed that the patient had a better outcome uh, if the blood sugars were maintained between 80 to 110. Let it there was a study in, done in Germany, the SEPNET German study, which was published in 2000, uh, which was later published and showed that the patient had increased mortality and increased that those were related to hypoglycemia, which was confirmed by the NICE sugar study. So our current goal is to maintain the blood sugar between 150 to 180 milligrams per deciliter. Talking about the packet cells, don't feel compelled to transfuse. Do not feel compelled to transfuse patients with packed red cells. The, the question is whether you should keep your hemoglobin at seven 
or you should keep your hemoglobin at 10. Do you follow a restrictive transfusion regimen or do you go to a liberal transfusion regimen? This has now been confirmed by several studies. Uh, the TRIST study, the transfusion in uh, uh, septic shock, the TRIC study, transfusion in critical care medicine, and the Canadian critical group uh, transfusion regimen. And all of them have clearly shown that the restrictive transfusion uh, is associated with a better outcome. Please do not feel compelled. There are implications of transfusing bacterial cells, you know, altering your immune system, similar to the mechanisms in graft versus host disease, causing more infection and increased mortality. You have enough studies now to show that the restrictive transfusion is good. Role of inotropes. I haven't used inotropes. 30 years ago, I was taught about what is called a myocardial depressant factor. If the myocardial depressant factor we know now is a TNF. When the lipopolysaccharide binds to macrophage receptor uh, 14, it causes liberation of TNF, and the TNF causes mitochondrial dysfunction and decreased oxygen utilization, paralyzing the oxygen utilization in the cells. So there are times we see, if you do an uh, echocardiogram in a patient with severe septic shock, you will <clears> see <throat> that uh, the uh, cardiac function may be affected, and that's due to tumor necrosis factor, but we haven't used vasopressor very much. I didn't hear Aisha cough, so I thought I had a little more time. I'll press on. Uh, <coughs> now, this, these are all the definitions of sepsis septic shock. It is a dysregulated uh, host response that causes septic shock. And when we moved over to, sep uh, to sepsis, and then septic shock is defined as a circulatory shock with cellular and metabolic abnormalities characterized by the use of vasopressors and mid arterial pressure get 65 millimeters of mercury, severe sepsis, you know, organ dysfunction, altered mental status, q sofa, systolic blood pressure, less than 10, and respiratory rate less than 22. This is what I was talking about, the uh, national warning, warning system. This came out of the uh, National Health uh, Society of the United Kingdom, but this is based on a model of MUSE, MEWS, which was practiced in the surgical ICU in the United States. Moving on, risk stratification for sepsis. If you have high lactate level, you're likely to do worse because that is, that is a predictor of cellular hypoxia and following, you know, G broader G. Wild published article in 1964 in the Journal of Science, when we first showed that if the lactate level is more than four, it is associated with decreased survival in septic shock. Uh, so lactate clearance and uh, measuring serial lactate is also good. Uh, these are the studies that I was talking about. The process arise and promise the usual studies as good. A role of antibiotics, initiation of inappropriate antibiotics resulted in a five-fold uh, initiation of inappropriate antibiotics is associated with a five-fold increase in mortality or five-fold reduction in survival. And we all know that you know, it applies to whether there's gram-negative, gram-positive or fungal infection, and treatment should be given early. And de-escalation of antibiotic in the last line here is associated with better survival, and antibiotic duration should be limited by guidelines. Static pressure not reliable, <laughs> dynamic pressure we go, fluid resuscitation, do we really have to do that 30 cc per kg with our you know, dynamic fluid assessment? We should rethink outside the box and think about introducing the early vasopressors and uh, maybe at a low dose, uh, thinking that this is a distributive uh, uh, shock and vasodilatory shock. Regarding the fluid resuscitation, I really want you to know the SPOT trial and the SALT trial, which have shown the adverse effect of unbalanced fluid hyperchloramia associated with renal uh, dysfunction and also mortality. The numbers needed to treat is 100 to decrease the mortality. Uh, now, this is a controversy on the fluid resuscitation. The phases of fluid resuscitation, we are very aggressive and we do very well with rescue phase. We do very well with optimization phase. We do very poorly with stabilization and de-escalation. And as you go, walk into it, I see you, how many times do you see a gangrenous food from vasopressors? And how many times you see your patient has gained 30 pounds or more and is overblown 
increase the, increasing the backward pressure, interstitial fluid pressure, and decreasing tissue perfusion. Now, vasopressor therapy, we already talked about a little bit. Uh, the VAS therapy was published by Jim Russell, where he combined the vasopressin to norepinephrine. And in a subgroup analysis of that, you know, there was shown to be a little better outcome when we are not using the maximal dose of norepinephrine. Dan D. Baker from Belgium has clearly shown there is no role for dopamine in the treatment either of septic or cardiogenic shock because that's associated with increased mortality related to cardiac arrhythmia. Very tempting and, uh, you know, very impressive studies done by Kanna and others published in the ethos trial about the role of angiotensin II in uh, septic shock. Now understand that, you know, all, all your vasopressors act on the pre-capillary <laughs> artery, pre-capillary artery, causing decreasing tissue perfusion. Angiotensin II acts on the post-capillary, increasing capillary recruitment and tissue perfusion. I hear Aisha coughed already. Uh, S, angiotensin converting enzyme is an ectoenzyme, which is tremendously deficient in septic shock. As a result, angiotensin one is not converted to angiotensin II. Uh, Corticosteroid, I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Firoz Bhai. It's such a huge topic and you have covered probably uh, all the recent literature that we need to remember. If I can just point out that Firoz Bhai went through the mean arterial pressure, he made a tremendous point about the fluids. Shabai ke je 30 cc dite hobe amun kotha nahi, kintu amra optimize korte hobe and at the same time, now we are trending towards early pressor, vasopressor therapy, norepinephrine preferred, and then vasopressin. When should we use albumin? Very little, maybe in cirrhosis, very little role. He talked about balanced fluid, early antibiotic, appropriateness of antibiotic, and then de-escalating. Ita amade next to speaker bolbe. And then he talked about atrial fibrillation, which is so common in, um, in septic shock. He talked about corticosteroid. Kokhon babuhar korte hobe, kothota babuhar korte hobe. Khub clearly kintu bolche. Corticosteroids amra use korbo kono corticosteroid stimulation test door kan nai. If your fluids plus the vasopressors do not work, then you can add hydrocortisone. 50 milligrams IVQ6 for seven days. He talked about goal-directed therapy. Serum lactate is a very important marker. Amadde to the mix venous oxygen to the measure now, we can use the lactate and follow serial lactates. That's what we do. He talked about glucose, very important. Amrakin to low glucose at the Gatilam in the last two decades. Akun kintu bola hoche. Glucose 150 to 180 is uh, optimal. 150 He talked about transfusion. It is a tremendous take home message. Goto Tirish Bachore, Goto Loke Jamra, critical care physician, iatrogenic polycythemia, Dieti, Erbothai Hishabnai, a job of Amadir Bothai Dite Hobe. The number is seven. Hemoglobin to the seven year com hoi transfuse korte hobe, more than seven. There is no proven data to more than seven hole better outcome hobe. So seven in niche hole transfuse korte hobe. And he talked about the demerits of dobutamine and dopamine. Thank you so much, Firuz Bhai. I'll ask the panelists to give their comments at the end of this segment. I'm going to invite Dr. Fatima Ahmed, who's the next speaker. And she's going to talk about antibiotic associated harm in the ICU. I want to Aisha, draw if, with... Aisha, if I can make a quick comment, I have some uh, appointments, so I'll try to stay as long as I can. I may not be able to stay the whole session. Thank you. Thank you, Bhai. Thank you, you fascinating lecture. Um, so I want to draw your attention to the next two speakers, Dr. Fatima Ahmed and Dr. Kanis Fatima. Bisher Jahakichu Mohan Srishti Chirukullan Kor 
অর্ধেকটার করি আছে নারী অর্ধেকটার নর আমরা দেখেছি যে দের ইজ এ ট্রেমেন্ডাস অ্যামাউন্ট অফ ফিমেল ফিজিশিয়ানস ইন দ্য ফিল্ড স্পেশালি ইন বাংলাদেশ এখন মেজরিটি মেজর মেডিকেল কলেজে দেখা যাচ্ছে যে ফিমেল স্টুডেন্টরা অনেক ব্রাইট এবং এগি আছে সো কিন্তু মিড লেভেলে এসে আমরা বসে থাকি আমরা এগোই না সো ডক্টর কানিস ফাতেমা অ্যান্ড ডক্টর ফাতেমা আহমেদ আর টু আইকনস নট অনলি ইন বার্ডেম অ্যান্ড ইন বাংলাদেশ আমি ওদেরকে দুজনকেই বলি যে তোমরা যে কত ইম্পর্টেন্ট বাংলাদেশে তোমরা হয়তো নিজেরা জানো না সো ভেরি প্রাউড অফ দ্য টু অফ ইউ ডক্টর ফাতেমা আহমেদ ইজ অ্যাসোসিয়েটেড প্রফেসর অফ ক্রিটিক্যাল কেয়ার মেডিসিন ইন বার্ডেম হসপিটাল অ্যান্ড শি ইজ ওয়েল নোন ইন বাংলাদেশ আমার বড় করে ব্যাখ্যা দেওয়া দরকার নাই শি ইজ গোয়িং টু টক অন দ্য অ্যান্টিবায়োটিক অ্যাসোসিয়েটেড হার্ম ইন দ্য আইসিইউ Thank you, Fatima. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Fatima. I'm sharing my screen. Speak to Jure Bolte Habe, Fatima. I am sharing my screen. Am I audible? Yes, I'm... yes. But speak to Jure Bolo Tahuli Habe. Okay. Uh, good evening and good morning who are in America and other, other area. And Assalamu Alaikum. Thank you very much, Madam, for the kind introduction. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for this invitation. Today, I'm going to highlight on antimicrobial-associated harm in critical care. It's a widespread belief that prompt use of antimicrobial outweighs any potential problem, and it can be introduced in any infection. Due to this belief, Antibiotic consumption is increasing in our country day by day. 2020, it was 30.81%, but in 2017, it was only 16.65%. So my question is, how many of our hospitalized patients are getting antibiotic? And how many of our ICU patients are getting antibiotic? In a research, it shows an, an international point prevalence study showed it demonstrated that 70% of patients in ICU are administered at least one antibiotic. In our setting, it is probably more higher. Antibiotics are very essential drug, no doubt, but it has collateral damages. There is some unintended consequence of antibiotic therapy. It might be drug and dose related due to during initiation of antimicrobial therapy duration of antimicrobial therapy might be combination of broad spectrum antibiotic may lead to antimicrobial resistance there may be drug toxicity and there may be drug adverse reaction there may be mitochondrial dysfunction and there may be impact on microbiome so i'm going through one by one and when what we do in icu in icu when a patient came with uh, came with the infection or sepsis we try to initiate as early as possible antibiotic as previous previous speaker said but if inappropriate uh, drug and inappropriate dose and if it is duration is not perfect then it can cause harm to the patient in septic patient, what we see that early initiation of antimicrobial therapy reduce the mort reduce the huge mortality. And it is uh, many a time we see this, it is very difficult to identify sepsis mimic, non-infectious sepsis mimics in IC, and it is very challenging. But don't jump on uh, antibiotic to treat fever, C-reacty protein, procalcitonin, or chest X-ray infiltrate, but use antibiotic to treat bacterial infection. Always ask one question, does the patient in ICU have any infection? Is bacterial infection? Indiscriminate empirical antibiotic use in patients who have uncomplicated infection, who don't have bacterial infection, obviously do harm to the patients. For the resistance, bacteria has been demonstrated with uh, antibiotic, brief antibiotic exposure, one to three days in IC patients. So ask one question to yourself, do I need the antibiotics? 
do I need to give antibiotics to the patient? Or can I wait and watch? In some situation, when taking a sepsis, septic shock, we come to watch and wait. But if it is not sepsis patient, not hypotensive, and patient have different ventilator associated condition, think about it if you can watch and wait and don't jump on antibiotic. If we use overzealous antibiotic without taking into consideration the spectrum, recent antimicrobial use, prior hospitalization, prior colonization, and infection with MDR organism, and without thinking pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic, and this leads to huge mortality of a septic patient. It is in this study, uh, there is it's shown that potentially resistant pneumonia uh, treated with guideline that leads to mortality because it is, this is not considering the previous antibiotic exposure, previous MDR resistant organism. So some patients are atypical when they are severe infection with resistant organism. Uh, treatment will be individualized and think about the uh, optimization of antibiotic therapy. In this study, it shows inappropriate empirical therapy, what we do in a patient the, after uh, sending the culture, were noted as a significant factor for mortality in patient of M MDL gum-negative bacteria. So empiric choice is very important for initiation of antibiotic therapy. One important thing is uh, before giving antibiotic, we send cultures to identify the source. If we don't send it, then uh, if we don't know the organism, then what we are going to treat? Then treatment failure and resistant organism might be increased in case of lab services in a decrease. In this slide, we can see we can see there is a graph plasma concentration, and there is time and plasma concentration graph. If bacteria is killed, when drug level is above the MIC, if drug level is below MIC, then there is a selection of mutant window, there is more resistant organism may grow, and there might be treatment failure. So we need, sometimes we need to um, check the therapeutic level of drugs to optimize the dose. So plasma concentration is important, especially the lactam, genomycin, and vancomycin. And we have to optimize with this level, PKP the optimization to, for better outcome, better fashion outcome, and reduce toxicity and you know, less resistance. Duration of antibiotic, it is not longer, not 10 days, 12 days, 14 days, it is shorter. Previous speaker said, Antibiotic is shorter duration, even in sepsis and septic shock. Shorter as much as possible, it's five to seven days. And daily descalation. In this research, there is a risk of new resistance will continue to increase is, as the duration of exposure is longer. So shorter is better. Even in interdominal infection with source control, you can continue four to five days. Cap five days, hospital acquired infection, seven days. If you try to make the longer duration of antibiotic, think about why you will increase the uh, duration of antibiotic therapy because longer antibiotic therapy will increase the mortality rate. In this research shows more than two thirds of cases I saw acquired a bacteremia are caused by MDO organism because it is due to prior exposure or during exposure of, of antibiotic of ICU patients. So if we give the uh, antibiotic op without optimization, there might be development of MDR, XDR, dendrop resistant organism, and there will be redundant use of antibiotics. What happens if we, we choi our choice is not perfect? or inappropriate choice of antibiotic, the sensitive organism is killed, and then there's an organism developed. This is called antibiotic selection. And uh, even in, it is an, it is an uh, in our country, DSME knew that shows 52% of ICU or multi-drug resistant, resistant um, strains, and antibiotic resistant is increasing there by the 14%. 
Why resistance is concerned? Resistance is concerned because it leads to treatment failure. It leads increases mortality, morbidity, risk of longer hospitalization, repeated hospitalization, longer hospital stay, and need uh, for expensive and broad spectrum antibiotic. And it is very expensive. Expensive in our country, it is not affo affordable for everyone. And threaten to pre antibiotic era selection pressure will be higher. And may, may spread resistant bacteria in the community. And um, there is superbug, bad bug, and there is no drug. In this, this um, graph, we can see that in South Asian country, there is carbapenem resistant, as in bacteria is higher. We can see here that. KPC is uh, more, KPC, carbopenem resistant Klebsiella, KPC producing, is higher in, in South Asian countries. So, in our resistant pattern is uh, uh, dangerous now. Other drug toxicities, other dr toxicities or harm by drugs are uh, antimicrobial associated with wide range of well recognized a detrimental side effect like neurotoxicity, cardiotoxicity, nephrotoxicity, and hepatotoxicity. Aminoglycoside glycopeptides, polymyxins have those dependent risk of nephrotoxicity. And therapeutic drug monitoring is uh, important for these drugs to optimize the drug and, uh, and safety of nef reduce the nephrotoxicity. Beta-lactam and macrolides induce neurotoxicities. Fluoroquinolone and macrolides leads to cardiac dysarrhythmias. Fluoroquinolone also associated with collagen toxicity leads to aortic aneurysm and tendinopathy in elderly patients. It is very serious. Antimicrobial may lead to plasma and other drug interactions. Other adverse, um, other harm can a drug, antibiotic can do is adverse drug reaction. It might be dose, uh, dose dependent or idiosyncratic. It might be toxic epidemic or necrolysis or Steven Johnson syndrome or various type of systemic and organ specific reaction like serum sickness, hypersensitivity, vasculitis, injuridema, and nephritis, interstitial nephritis. In sick patients, it is sometimes very difficult to identify allergic reaction. Antibiotic cause uh, many other harms. Antibiotic can cause mitochondrial dysfunction. Mitochondria is a very important organ for immune uh, adaptive immunity in case of septic shock and also other infections. And uh, mitochondrial dysfunction is implicated in the physiology of organ dysfunction in sepsis. At clinically relevant doses, exposure to bactericidal antimicrobial results in mitochondrial the mito Mighty mitochondria become weaker. So, antibiotic is uh, optimal use of is very important to protect the end mitochondria. Mitochondria is uh, very important for immune function. If there is defect in mitochondrial function, there is increased risk of secondary infection, and there might be immune paralysis, and uh, there is a blunted immune adaptive immunity. And another harm for, caused by antibiotic is dysbiosis, disruption of microbiome. When an imbalance of common cells and pathogenic bacteria occur in microbiome known as dysbiosis. And disease increases local and systemic disease, including healthcare record infection and other complications. Also give rise to MDO organisms like escape organisms. These are very dangerous organisms, multi drug resistance organisms, and very difficult to treat. So another uh, harm by antibiotic overuse is disruption of microbiomes. Divert, it can cause divert inflammation and organ dysfunction directly. And there is also decrease in diversity and common cell organism of skin, oral, respiratory, and GI tract of ICU patients that leads to multiple diseases and infection. So antibiotic can uh, uh, produce dysbiosis and blanket innate and adaptive immunity of a person. Impact of uh, it is another harm by 
antimicrobial. If he is used indiscriminately or longer duration or excessive doses, then this is a graph showing before, this is the common cells before antibiotic use and this is after antibiotic use. Here the fungus, candida growth is used. Common cell is changed like an oral fungus, systemic fungal infection can be happening in the overuse of antibiotics. So, other important thing is Clostridium associated diarrhea. Clostridium is a very dangerous infection and it can cause colitis, perforation, and severe infections. So, these are the many factors, uh, many problems antibiotic can do. But how can then the next question come forward? How can we reduce the harm? It's not so simple, so easy. It's very difficult for each exception to reduce the harm. To mitigate antimicrobial harm, it is required to multifaceted approach. And through the antimicrobial stewardship program, this is antimicrobial stewardship program. My next speaker will go through this antimicrobial stewardship program. First of all, we have to enhance infection prevention and control. We need to introduce some infection prevention and control care bundles to prevent and surveillance of infections and introduce repeated infection control. I think every institution and every department should have infection control committee that will decide and that will implement and that that committee will uh, surveillance and infection prevention and controls then controlling the source of infection antibiotic will not work if you don't uh, control the source then antibiotic prescription and uh, who need truly uh, in sepsis mimics non-infectious cases even they are not bacterial like an covid patient they are not bacterial infection viral infection and antibiotic will not work on that then appropriate antibiotic with adequate doses if needed drug level monitoring plasma monitoring and according to pkpd and uses shorter duration my previous speaker told de-escalation repeated de-escalation shorter duration and even in septic shock is possible and reassessment of treatment culture and the results are available and supporting surveillance of uh, antimicrobial resistance and healthcare acquired infections and monitoring and antibiotic consumption. And last, simulating, uh, simulating antibiotic stewardship program. Stewardship program in each unit, each department. And then it's very important optimizing uh, if, uh, antibiotic therapy. It is diagnostic, consists of diagnostic stewardship and antimicrobial stewardship. <coughs> Diagnostic stewardship is very important because quicker the culture reaches the lab, the shorter and sooner a bacteria can be identified. So correct antibiotic can be prescribed. Mitoprotective, which is a research agenda, probiotic can be used. If you need, can have a stewardship program checklist and checklist like a start of antibiotic why they will start an antibiotic we do 48 hours uh, later on then after five days or daily de-escalation daily reassessment and de-escalation and everyone can make a checklist and if every physician and nurses twice daily check for de-escalation and i lastly i want to say I want to say that is said by the father of modern medicine, Sir William Osler. The person who takes the medicine must recover twice. Once from the disease and once from the medicine. So it is not an easy thing, easy thing to reduce the harm. It is possible when everyone can take role play in optimizing antibiotics and reduce the indiscriminate use of antibiotics and implement stewardship program. If we are not thinking about it, let's think from today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fatima. Absolutely a star performance. 
একেবারে সময়ের একটু অল্প আগে শেষ করেছ ধন্যবাদ দিয়ে শেষ করা যাবে না আর ট্রেমেন্ডাস ট্রেমেন্ডাস থটস আর সবার মধ্যে একটা প্রশ্ন জাগিয়েছো তুমি যে ডু বি নিড টু রিকভার টোয়াইস ওয়ান্স ফ্রম দ্য ডিজিজ এন্ড দেন ফ্রম দ্য মেডিসিন খুবই খুবই সময় উপযোগী প্রশ্ন ফাতেমা ওয়েন্ট থ্রু দ্য মার্কার্স অফ স্টার্টিং খুব ইম্পর্টেন্টলি যদি ফাতেমার টেক হোম মেসেজ হয় যে রিসেন্ট এডমিশন রিসেন্ট ইউজ অফ অ্যান্টিবায়োটিক এমডিআর বা ড্রাগ রেজিস্টেন্সকে ইনসিডেন্স বাড়ায় সো উই হ্যাভ টু বি ভেরি জুডিশিয়াল আমরা যতদূর মনে পড়ে আমরা ট্রেনিংয়ে আমরা প্রথমে শুনতাম সাত থেকে চোদ্দ দিন অ্যান্টিবায়োটিক দিতে হবে তারপর আসলো সাত থেকে দশ দিন এখন কিন্তু বলা হচ্ছে পাঁচ থেকে সাত দিন সুতরাং সাত দিন থেকে বেশি কখনোই না আমাদের রিয়েলি এটা চিন্তা করতে হবে অ্যান্ড অ্যান্টিবায়োটিক ইউজ ইজ ইন দ্য রাইজ অ্যান্টিবায়োটিক রেজিস্টেন্স ইজ ইন দ্য রাইজ সুপার ইনফেকশন একটা ট্রিমেন্ডাস প্রবলেম তো থ্যাংক ইউ ভেরি মাচ ফর ইউর টাইমলি প্রেজেন্টেশন আমরা কমেন্টস শুনব ফ্রম প্যানেলিস্ট I would like to go on to the next speaker. Um, actually, Jishu uh, Krishter, John Mero, Hippocrates said, every medicine is poison. I didn't say that. Hippocrates said that. So let's see what the next speaker has to say. The next speaker is also a rising star in Bangladesh, Dr. Kanis Fatima. She is the Associate Professor of in Critical Care Medicine in Burdham Hospital in Dhaka. She's going to talk about antibiotic stewardship in the ICU. This is absolutely a burning issue in every ICU in the whole world. Dr. Kani's Fatima, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon from Bangladesh. First, I like to express my gratitude to Planetary Health Academia for arranging uh, this wonderful critical care conference challenges in 2021. And my special thanks to Aisha Madam and Tasbir Sir, who are always there when we need them. Respected panelists and dear audience, I'm Dr. Kanis Fatima, Associate Professor from Department of Critical Care Medicine, Bardem General Hospital now going to speak on antimicrobial stewardship in ICU. I have nothing to disclose and uh, I'll cover these topics in my today's presentation. My uh, previous speaker, Dr. Fatima Ahmed has very clearly and beautifully spoken about the antibiotic associated harm. We all know that discovery of the antibiotics in the early 20th century has dramatic effect on the healthcare system by reducing the mortality and morbidity from the infectious disease and making the uh, organ transplant and chemotherapy possible. But with widespread and injudicious use of antibiotic has gradually decreasing its efficacy. This is the uh, picture by Infectious Disease Society of America in 2004. 17 years has passed, but there is still no improvement rather deterioration of the condition. Let's have a quick look on the antimicrobial resistance pattern in our hospital. This is the largest hospital treating diabetic and endocrine patient in the Asian region. I have collected this data from our microbiology department, uh, which showed the isolated resistance, uh, resistance pattern of the isolated organism collected from sample attending our indoor and outdoor department. We can see that the percentage of ESBL positive Ischia coli is more than 40% and that of Klebsiella is more than 20%. Unfortunately, the nalidoxic acid resistance Salmonella typhi, the percentage is gradually increasing over the years and in the 2018, it has reached 100%. The uh, percentage of MRSA varies from uh, 20 to 30 percent. Fortunately, still there is no isolated VRE, that is vancomycin resistant enterococci. What is the resistance pattern in our ICU, where the most critically ill patients are being served? These are the major organisms isolated from various samples uh, in our ICU in the year first half of 2018. The commonest one was Asantobacter, followed by Klebsiella, Candida, Ischia coli, Pseudomonas, and Staphylococcus aureus. 
we can see that the isolated acinetobacter and isolated Klebsiella were highly resistant to all the available antibiotic, having sensitivity only against cholestin. The isolated Echthyia coli have good sensitivity against the aminoglycoside, imipenem, and piperacin tazobactam group, but they are highly resistant to ciprofloxacin and third generation cephalosporin. The pseudomonas were also highly resistant to the available antibiotic, only having good sensitivity against piperacillin tazobactam. So what is the impact of this high resistance? When a person is infected with drug resistant organism, their mortality increase around twofold and they have delayed recovery, recurrent infection, treatment failure, increased length of stay in the hospital or in the ICU and increase in the cost. And these resistant organisms have a negative impact on us, the physician. Uh, as the uh, infection with resistant organism increases the mortality and morbidity, so we, the physician, became more aware about the multidrug resistant organism. And we use the broad spectrum antibiotics more. Because of this overprescribing, the resistant organisms increases more and more. This is a vicious cycle. It has been found that 20 to 50 percent of the antibiotics prescribed in the acute care hospitals are unnecessary, and 30 to 60 percent of them uh, prescribed in ICUs are either unnecessary or inappropriate or suboptimal. So, what we should do to overcome this burning issue? We have only two weapons in our hand infection prevention and control, and antimicrobial stewardship because there is almost no uh, or minimum new drug in the pipeline. So we have to focus on these two. And my today's presentation on this antimicrobial stewardship program. The Infectious Disease Society of America, Pediatric Infectious Disease Society, and uh, Society of Healthcare Epidemiology America has defined ASP as coordinated intervention designed to improve the appropriate use of antibiotics by promoting the selection of optimal antibiotic regimen including dosing, duration of therapy, and route of administration. In a short way, we can say that it involves the choice of right antimicrobial at the right time, giving it in right dose for the right duration. Our aim should be improvement of the patient, that is, improvement the, in the clinical outcome with minimum or no harm or collateral damage. Why we should develop the antimicrobial stewardship program in the ICU? Because there is high use of antibiotics in the intensive care units. And uh, it has been found that the point prevalence of antibiotic use was uh, around 70% in ICU, whereas only 45% of the critically ill patients have microbiologically proven or radiologically proven infection. In the ICU, the risk of antimicrobial resistance is more because there is loss of physiological defenses of the patient, high risk of cross, uh, cross transmission and high use of antibiotics. So if we implement antimicrobial stewardship program in ICU, there will be improved patient outcome, reduction in the adverse event, improvement in the rate of antibiotic susceptibility and optimization of the resource utilization. There are several studies about the ASP implementation in the ICU, and it has been found that ASP intervention causes up to 36% reduction in the antimicrobial consumption, annual cost reduction of up to $900,000. It decreases in the rate of closet and difficile infection, and overall there is improvement in the rate of clinical cure and mortality from various infectious diseases. And for this, we have to work together as a team. The stewardship team in the ICU should be led by an intensivist. Intensivist, uh, because of their clinical expertise, have also role in the stewardship team of the hospital, not only in the ICU. And they should also uh, play a role in the uh, making of antibiotic guideline of the hospital. Infectious disease specialist also has crucial role in the team. They can help us in dealing with difficult to treat infection or in case of rare infection. 
nurses should be empowered to ask questions about the antibiotics and uh, give us reminder about the when the antibiotics are given for more than seven days or like this. Clinical pharmacists with infectious disease training can help us in adjustment of the dose of the antibiotics, especially in patients with hepatic or renal failure. Microbiologists and laboratory staff, they also have very important role in collecting the specimen before starting antibiotic and giving us the report of uh, culture report when it is available and give us warning when there is multidrug resistant organism. Before implementing any antimicrobial stewardship program in the ICU, we always need some baseline data, like the local antibiogram, which uh, microbes are uh, prevalent in our ICU. Like as I have uh, previously shown the microbiological profile in our ICU, in our ICU, almost 95% patients are diabetic. This picture may not be found in the ICU population in the Dhaka Medical College Hospital or Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University. So knowing the local antibiogram is very much important. At the same time, before starting the stewardship program, we have to know the prescribing pattern of us, the physician, and uh, assessment of percentage of the uh, empirical therapy prescription, which has been given by the duty doctors. For this, the hospital epidemiologist and information system specialist can help us. These are the core elements of antibiotic stewardship, which my previous speaker has already described. I'm uh, going through this uh, in individual point. First, we have to identify patient with infection rapidly because we all know that each hour delay in giving antibiotic in patient with sepsis or septic shock can cost their life. So we have to identify that, uh, that our patient has infection by taking proper history and doing proper clinical examination. And besides this, some biomarker like procalcitonin can help us in identifying the patient with infection. Procalcitonin has also important role in guiding us for how long or for uh, how, uh, how much duration we are going to give the antibiotic. Sometimes we think that in ICU, if uh, the procalcitonin is going down and if we cut down the antibiotic, patient may deteriorate. Uh, in that case, there is prorata trial, which showed that Patient in the procalcitonin group had significantly more deaths without antibiotic than the control group. And this was not associated with poorer outcome. That is cutting down the antibiotic depending on the procalcitonin does not cause any harm. When the initial antibiotic has been given to a patient with infection, this empirical antibiotic should be chosen on the basis of the local antimicrobial susceptibility pattern and keeping uh, in mind about the, their side effect of the antibiotics. We also have to search that whether the patient has received any antibiotics in the preceding two weeks. If so, we have to exclude that antibiotic. And uh, for this evidence-based guideline involving all discipline, that is medicine, surgery, gynae, and pediatrics should be developed in all hospitals. Uh, most of the time, when a patient came to ICU, not uh, the specialists are not always present. Uh, the duty doctors who are resident or fellows, they prescribe the antibiotics. We must teach them that uh, we have to send culture before starting any antibiotic. Unnecessary line or catheter should be taken out when it is not necessary and antibiotics should be given only to patient with infection. We should not treat any colonization or any contamination. And all doctors should know how to differentiate between these. Now, several uh, interventions have been tried in uh, several studies in different ICUs across the globe to reduce or change antibiotic use. The most commonly studied and effective intervention are prospective audit and feedback. It is a restrictive approach. Uh, some advocate that pre-authorization, especially from an infectious disease specialist is needed before prescribing an antibiotic. 
but uh, this is time consuming and not always possible. Formulary restriction should be done, especially for antibiotic, which are broad spectrum or have uh, growing resistance or have higher uh, toxicity level. But sometimes formulary restriction can cause us squeeze out the balloon effect. That is, uh, we are squeezing the balloon uh, or squeezing some antibiotic and resistance grow for other antibiotics. What focus antimicrobial round may be given by the microbiologist along with the intensivist? Then the prospective audit and feedback, which involves the prescriber after an antibiotic has been prescribed, but it needs voluntary compliance from the ISO physicians and is labor intensive. Like uh, the procalcitonin, uh, uh, cutting down the antibiotic depending on the procalcitonin, some intensivists think that if we follow the uh, prospective audit and feedback in ISO, it may have negative effect on our ISO population. But in this study, uh, which is a systematic review on 11 uh, studies and uh, which uh, uses the mortality as an outcome, it has been found that prospective audit and feedback does not cause increased mortality in the ICU patient. So we can use it safely. Now, after 48 to 70 hours, uh, 72 hours, when we get the culture report, we have to deescalate the antimicrobes. And when we uh, give the appropriate antibiotic, we should give it for shortest effective duration. When the patient is clinically improved, we can convert the parenteral drug to enteral form. Routine review of antimicrobial regimen should always done daily and greater emphasis should be given on the adverse effect of the antimicrobials. In the ICU, the volume of distribution of the antimicrobials uh, and drug <coughs> clearance vary greatly among the patient, depending on their uh, hyperdynamic circulation, altered fluid balance, hepatic or renal dysfunction, or whether they are on organ support. So we have to adjust the dose accordingly. And uh, we all know that some drug can cause us concentration dependent killing like ammonoglycoside and some causes time dependent killing. And it has been found that prolonged infusion of the beta lactam drugs, which causes the time dependent killing, it causes better outcome of the ISO patient. Education and training is a uh, important cornerstone of the ASP program. It should be included in the undergraduate and postgraduate medical training and, of course, in the critical care medicine curricula. I have already mentioned that nursing staff should be empowered to ask questions and pharmacists should uh, may help us in uh, implementing this antimicrobial stewardship program. Electronic medical record, we can use electronic medical record, electronic prescribing and clinical decision supporting system, microbiology laboratories, uh, have very important role because culture still, culture is the gold standard for identifying microbes and the antibiotic sensitivity. But nowadays rapid diagnostic tests are also important though still they are not available in our country. The uh, microbiology department can provide us antibiotic and it should be stratified and it is better to if they give us selective and cascade reporting. This is the antibiogram uh, provided us to us by our microbiology department. And another very important thing is that we have to work as a team and each member of the team is very, very important role in the antimicrobial stewardship program. So as I have time limitation, I'm moving uh, very fast. What are the barriers in implementing the stewardship program? First of all, severity of the disease process. There is variation in antimicrobial prescription due to differences in the professional background, clinical experience, knowledge, and attitude. And some antibiotics, uh, I uh, should say not some, most of the antibiotics are usually prescribed before the patient admitted in the ICU. Sometimes few physicians do not prescribe according to the microbiology result and use bot spectrum antibiotic when narrow spectrum is effective. We should. Uh, use the narrow spectrum antibiotic first. I'll skip this slide. Now, every intensivist know the importance of antimicrobial stewardship program, but they have difficulty in implementing this program in their own ISO. And there are three uh, main reasons. 
first of all, infection severity of the critically ill patient, which uh, prevent us in de-escalating antimicrobes, sometimes limited expertise of the doctors, and difficulty to ensure disease continuity of care by the same medical team 24 hours in seven days. To overcome this barrier, we can use bedside tool like bundle approach, which is famous in ICU like VAB bundle or CVC bundle. We can use this bedside tool bundle. We can start broadly, narrow quickly, and get rid of the antibiotics when it is not necessary. American Thoracic Society, uh, they have organized a workshop in year of 2016, and they have identified that the fear of pathogen that are not covered by the empirical antibiotic plays a major role in de-escalating antibiotics. And another important role is that antibiotic stewardship program ensure the improvement of overall antibiotic use, not only the cutting down on de-escalating antibiotics. In 1945, in an uh, interview with New York Times, Sir Alexander Fleming warned that antibiotic will develop resistance. True to his prediction, this is not a forecast now. It is happening all over the world, across the globe. And if we do not stop it now, we will pass into a post-antibiotic era where people may die from minimum infection. So dear learned audience, implementation of antimicrobial stewardship program in ISO is very, very important and time demanding necessary now. It can reduce antimicrobial resistance, incidence of healthcare associated infection, and is cost effective, especially for countries like us. And a successful ASP require interdisciplinary team, educational intervention, and feedback to healthcare worker. A well-structured group discussion focused at the barrier and facilitator, which influence the antimicrobial use, is very, very helpful. Our country has gained tremendous uh, improvement in child mortality, reducing child mortality and maternal mortality, in eradicating polio and other, some other infectious disease. We are hoping that in your future, we can implement this antibiotic stewardship program, not only in ISO, but also all over the hospitals across the country. Thank you all, especially the Planetary Health Academia for giving me the opportunity to present in this forum. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kaniz, who is always a star performer. Um, how do we practice standardized evidence-based care? How do we do the best practice guideline and how do we monitor adverse effects? Very systematically went through all of it. And I was actually fascinated by the data that both you and Fatima presented from Southeast Asia and from Bangladesh and from your own institutions. It shows how diligent you are. Khub shundur bhabe ki bhabe monitor korte hobe procalcitonin kakhon dekhte hobe ebong ki bhabe team approach. Eta amar sob chaite bhalo laglo. That's what we practice in United States. Amader onek khatti ache nijederi. Um so let me introduce the panelists again to come forward. We have an incredible lineup of faculty and panelists both from United States and Bangladesh. Shabchaite prothome, um, I will invite Professor Shahira Khatun Bela, jini ake bade chhatro chaya yamader ke ghire rekhe chen, yamader uh, utto shuri Bela pa. Uh, I invite you for your comments in the last three for the last three speakers. This will be followed by Dr. Hamidu Zaman, Dr. Tasbirul Islam, and Dr. Muhammad Tabriz. Thank you, Bela pa, please. Aisha, thank you so much. আমাকে সুযোগটা আগে করে দেওয়ার জন্য তো প্রথমে যে তিনজন স্পিকারে এত সুন্দর বলে গেল মনে হয় যেন আমরা শুধু যে তুমি পানি খাচ্ছ না এরকম গিলেই গেলাম খালি মানে এত সুন্দর প্রেজেন্টেশন আমার কাছে খুব খুব বেশি ভালো লেগেছে বেশি কিছু বলার নেই তারপরে অবশ্যই ফিরোজ উনি যে হিমোডাইনামিক্যাল স্ট্যাটাস স্টেবিলিটি পারফিউশন প্রেসার এসবের উপর বলে গেলেন ওনার তারপরে আসো দুই ফাতেমার কথা ফাতেমা আহমেদ 
ফাতেমা আহমেদ তো অ্যান্টিবায়োটিক্যাল অ্যাসোসিয়েটেড হার্মের উপরে রেজিস্টেন্সের উপরে খুব সুন্দর বলেছো প্রেজেন্টেশন আমি আগে শুনেছি আজকেও খুব ভালো লেগেছে আর গানিস বলে গেল রেজিস্ট্যান্ট প্যাটার্ন চেঞ্জেস আইসোলেটেড অর্গানিজমস ইনফ্যাক্ট রেজিস্ট্যান্স তো এগুলা যে সব কিছু আলটিমেটলি একটা নেগেটিভ ইফেক্ট নিয়ে আসে পেশেন্টের উপরে পেশেন্টের মর্টিভিটি মর্টিলিটি হসপিটাল স্টে কস্ট সব কিছু বেড়ে যাচ্ছে তো দিজ আর অল চ্যালেঞ্জেস অফ ট্রিটমেন্ট মানে আইসিউ তে আমরা যাদের ট্রিটমেন্ট করতে যাই এগুলো আসলে এই চ্যালেঞ্জগুলোর কথা আমরা সবাই কম বেশি জানি যে আইসিউ তে যাওয়া মানে আইসিউ তে তো বলাই হয় যে সাকসেস রেট আসলে এখনো বলা হয় যে not more than 60% due to এই অসুবিধা গুলোর জন্য যে তোমার ইনফেকশন হচ্ছে অ্যান্টিবায়োটিক রেজিস্ট্যান্ট হচ্ছে হিমোডাইনামিক্যালি ম্যানেজ করা যাচ্ছে না অর্গান সাপোর্ট ঠিকভাবে দেওয়া যাচ্ছে না এগুলো আসলে আমরা সবাই জানি কম বেশি এই এই চ্যালেঞ্জটা আমাদের শুধু দু হাজার একুশ সাল না এই চ্যালেঞ্জটা আমাদের সারা জীবন থাকবে এবং চ্যালেঞ্জটা আস্তে আস্তে ওই করোনা ভাইরাসের মতন মডুলেশন হবে চেঞ্জ হবে আমরা থেকে থেকে শিখে শিখে আরো বেশি চেঞ্জটাকে ফেস করতে পারবো বলে আমার যা মনে হচ্ছে আইসিউর ভেতরে ঢুকে গেলে যে প্রবলেম গুলা হয় সেই প্রবলেম গুলা কিন্তু ডক্টর ফিরোজ কান্ট্রি আমাদের বাংলাদেশেও যা আমেরিকাতেও তা ইউরোপেও তা তবে হ্যাঁ ভ্যারিয়েশনের তো অবশ্যই তফাত আছে কারণ আমাদের তো অনেক বেশি লিমিটেশন তোমাদের চাইতে আমি যেটা একটু বলতে চাই সেটা একটু কোভিড ডিজিজটা নিয়ে বলতে চাই কারণ এটা তো এখন প্যান্ডেমিক সারা বিশ্বে ছড়িয়ে আছে প্রথম দিকে যখন গত বছরের মার্চ মাসে আমাদের দেশে আসতে শুরু করলো তখন আমাদের কাছে ধারণা ছিল যে অনলি ফিফটি ফাইভ পার্সেন্ট পেশেন্ট নিডস আইসিউ সাপোর্ট আর ফিফটিন পার্সেন্ট ধরো হাসপাতাল ট্রিটমেন্ট ভালো হয়ে যাচ্ছে এইটটি পার্সেন্ট বাসাতেই ভালো হয়ে যাচ্ছে এবং ইনিশিয়ালি এই ডিজিজটা শুধুমাত্র ঢাকা শহর সহ বড় বড় হাসপাতালে ছিল যেমন একটা মজার কথা বলে রিক্সা দেখে মাস্ক পড়তে বললেই বলে আপনার এটা আমাদের অসুখ না এটা আপনাদের অসুখ এরকম আর কি ব্যাপারটা তো এই যে রুগীগুলা যারা আইসিউতে আসে এদের জন্য আমাদের অবস্থা তো জানোই দিন দিন খারাপ হয়ে যাচ্ছে আগামী পরশু দিন সোমবার থেকে আমাদের স্ট্রিক্ট লকডাউন শাটডাউন যে নামেই আসুক না কেন আসছে আর্মি থাকবে রাস্তায় বিজিবি থাকবে রাস্তায় যেটাই হোক না কেন সেই আমাদের বর্ডার এরিয়া থেকে এগুলা চলে আসতেছে আমরা সবাই জানছি যে এটাকে প্রিভেন্ট করার জন্য ডাব্লিউএইচও সহ আমাদের সরকার সারা বিশ্ব সব জায়গার একই কথা যে মাস্ক পরো হাত ধো এবং সোশ্যাল ডিস্টেন্স মেনটেন করো কিন্তু কে শোনে কার কথা শুনতেই চাচ্ছে না তো এখন যেটা হচ্ছে যে যে পেশেন্ট গুলো আমাদের হাসপাতালে আসছে দে আর সো ক্রিটিক্যালি ইল কারণ অলরেডি তো লাংস তো শেষই বাদ বাকি গুলো আস্তে আস্তে শেষের পথে তো ইট ইস রিয়েলি চ্যালেঞ্জ ইন হেলথ সার্ভিসেস ইন আওয়ার কান্ট্রি তো মোস্টলি যে চ্যালেঞ্জ গুলোর কথা বলা হচ্ছে দুটো চ্যালেঞ্জ হচ্ছে দুই ক্যাটাগরি চ্যালেঞ্জ একটা হচ্ছে হসপিটাল কন্টেস্ট আর একটা হচ্ছে তোমার স্টাফ রেজিস্টেন্স এর ব্যাপারে হসপিটাল কন্টেস্টে আমাদের বিশেষ করে বাংলাদেশে স্টিল উই আর ফেসিং স্টাফ স্টাফ শর্টেজ স্টাফ শর্টেজ মিনস ডাক্তার ফিজিশিয়ান স্পেশালিস্ট থেকে শুরু করে আমাদের সেই ক্লিনারটা পর্যন্ত উই আর ভেরি স্টাফ শর্টেজ দেন ইনস্টেবিলিটি অফ ফিজিশিয়ান্স পজিশনস lack of specialized essential services and absence of a system to establish do not resuscitate eta amader ekono established hoyni ar staff physicians er moddhe hocche ki amra jara doctor nurses ba onnanora jara paramedics achhi tara shobai kintu in addition to our own duties amra extra duty korchi amader ei icu ke support dewar jonno যেটা ওরা বলে গেল সেটা হচ্ছে একটা এস্টাবলিশ আইসিউর ভেতরে কি হচ্ছে সেটা যদি প্যান্ডেমিকে যে আইসিউর পেশেন্টটা এক্সট্রা আসছে সেই পেশেন্টটাকে সাপোর্ট দেওয়ার মতন 
ম্যান পাওয়ার বলো ইনস্ট্রুমেন্ট বলো ড্রাগস বলো ইমিউনাইজেশন বলো কোনোটাই কিন্তু আমাদের মধ্যে ওইখানে এখন পর্যন্ত আসেনি তারপরেও এখানে আরো কিছু প্রবলেম আছে এই যে যারা কোভিড নিয়ে আইসিতে ঢুকছে তাদের মধ্যে আগে তো বললাম যে অ্যাডিকুয়েট হেলথ ওয়ার্কার্স আমাদের নেই দেন কাশি দিয়ে ফেললা কমে থাকার জন্য ওরা সবসময় সবাই একটু টেনশনে থাকে সামহাও আমি সেকেন্ড কাশির অফার আর তোমাকে আমি সুযোগ দিচ্ছি না আমার কাছে তিনোর জনের বক্তব্য ভালো লেগেছে তবে আইসিউ মানে কোভিড থেকে যারা আইসিউতে যাচ্ছে কোভিড পেশেন্ট তাদের ওপরে যদি কেউ সামনে মধ্যে বলবে কেউ কারণ রাহান রাব্বানি বলবে আমি জানি রাহান রাব্বানি তো মির্জা আমাদের নাজিমুদ্দিনের খাজা মির্জা নাজিমুদ্দিনের চিকিৎসার সঙ্গে ওতপ্রোত ভাবে জড়িত ছিল আমি প্রতিদিন ওর থেকে খবর পেতাম তারপরে ফাঙ্গাল ইনফেকশনের উপরে বলবে আমি আশা করি আমরা সবাই একটা অনেক অনেক মেসেজ নিয়ে যেতে পারবো জানি না এত মেসেজ এর ভারে ঘুম হবে কিনা থ্যাংক ইউ আয়সা এবং থ্যাংক ইউ সো মাচ আয়সা আমাকে আমার সম্পর্কে অনেক কিছু বলেছে আমি শুধু একটা কথাই বলবো আয়সাকে নিয়ে সেটা হচ্ছে আয়সা মান্নান শেখদার আমার ওয়ান অফ দ্য ফেভারিট টিচার মান্নান স্যার এর যোগ্য মেয়ে থ্যাংক ইউ সো মাচ আপা অনেক অনেক ধন্যবাদ আপনার প্রেজেন্সটাই আমাদের জন্য যথেষ্ট আর আমরা বাংলাদেশে আপনারা যারা আছেন তাদের ভাই আপনি যদি একটু ছোট করে কমেন্ট দিতে পারতেন লাইন আপ আমি ডক্টর হাবিবুর রহমান লুলু থেকেও একটু কমেন্ট শুনবো থ্রি স্পিকার Thank you so much, Dr. Hamidu Zaman, please. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for inviting me. I really enjoy the talks. Uh, after Firoz's talk, there's nothing to talk about sepsis, but I'm pretty sure everybody got confused. The way I approach sepsis, whatever we know, unless I apply that. Septic shock is a combination of, by his talks, is a combination of hypovolemic or distributive shock and a cardiogenic component. And then we apply there the, the, the dynamic compliance now. So the process and promise trial is very low because there's no difference in mortality because the, there's a baseline standard of the, all the patients are resuscitated. So if we apply the same concept in our patients, when patients are actually emergency room, I know there is a talk after this, resuscitation in the ER of the septic shock patients. Once you get to the, dynamic, the uh, static number of eight, that means this backflow is there, that means your tank is filled up. So after the getting a CVP of eight, do not go by the numbers anymore. So if you have eight, that means you're not hypovolemic. After that, you go to the dynamic compliance, look at the stroke volume variation or pulse pressure variation. So there are a lot of non-invasive and invasive monitorings are available. So if your patient is hypovolemic at that time, then only give additional fluid to this patient. And Shoshojira Nisaya Mother, we resuscitate and they do not de-escalate. So there is a maintenance phase and there is a withdrawal phase. When the patient is diuresing, you also cut down on your fluids. And always look for the cardiogenic component. As he told, there's always there's a diastolic dysfunction in all your septic shock patients. And another 20% will have a systolic dysfunction. That's why the use of pressures come and leave off it as the test of time because it acts as a vasoconstrictor and also has an inotropic effect. So still the vasopressin and uh, and your uh, norepinephrine is the first uh, drug for pressors to use. The, then next I go to this excellent talk from my Bangladeshi colleagues about the antibiotic use, antibiotic stewardship. I'm impressed by the antibiogram data of the Bardem Hospital. I hope every hospital has that. And I mean, I wanted to make rounds and I was scared to make rounds in Bardem ICU. Because the, all the patients that came in, all they have already used every antibiotic in the world by the uh, <laughs> primary care physicians or before. So this is really a challenge for the ICU doctors in Bangladesh to take care of these patients. And what are you going to use? I think you know you cannot use anything except imipenem and vancomycin empirically. 
uh, that's why the stewardship of the antibiotic is probably very important. And Kanis Fatima has really excelled in her talks. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hamid Bhai, um, for your expert comments. I will move on to Dr. Tazbirul Islam for his comments. Dr. Tazbirul Islam is the chairman of PHA. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Appa. Uh, thanks all the panelists and speakers. Actually, I mean, I'm going to talk to you about the Fatima and Kanijer session lectures. So I'm going to talk to you about this. So I'm going to talk to you about hemodynamics. I'm going to talk to you about the target of the map. I'm going to talk to you about 16, 65, 18, right? So I can have a lot of controversial data. I'm going to talk to you about the age of 75. Bollage is 60 and above is okay. Uh, but there are chronic hypertension on multiple medications for blood pressure, probably a little high, maybe 70 to 75. Uh, uh, otherwise, 65. Monarch have a basic target collecting to add it, basic catecholamine is called a high shake the added me or some of one attack. About Shedano, I'm a 60 for the older population, 65 for general population. Uh, there are chronically, I mean, a very hypertensive patient, uh, history of hypertension, Tadu Hyderabad, 70, 75, Korajita party, but not more than 75. Act. Do you number of CVP target? I'm not going to I'm going PLR take Kori, passive leg raising test day, him dynamic jitter, response jitter jitter, how Firoz Bhai Bolo. Abong Shiro Chami Kori more subsequent fluid. First initial 30 cc. Uh, without checking anything, uh, unless I'm really of concern about the fluid of the fluorid palmodium, but big as it is, but EF is 10%. Shake it through about PLR target, Korea. Otherwise, 30 cc at the airport, then subsequent fluid, I based on the PLR test. The number of kitchen fluid, kitchen genage, albumin term use Korea is very expensive. In the albumin term, you score your chem, did a bowl of it was by hepatogenal syndrome by spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Can act like a trick in the albumin contraindicated. She wrote that a traumatic brain injury on the top of sepsis and traumatic brain injury. Albumin knives score a tape hollow. Our kitchu genish in the horizon now, chinta karahoche jaman granular side colony stimulating factor, did a neutropenic sepsis a catch codic in a non neutropenic agono, jaman data nai, hoche ka, did a camera neutrophil level take a boost code the body. Abong duration of neutropenia, did a comma the party hoita beta ki tomar beneficial kina and non neutropenic patient. Tapo jaman aritoche. Um, uh, endotoxin removal maneuver. Jaman uh, absorption, uh, absorption with uh, polymers in B fiber. Did uh, you have you first trial at the Kichuta beneficial into a small study abong did a high level endotoxin thake. Shake it through by high volume hemoperfusion. Did catch kore kina. She can report a cholche catch. Tapa IV IG ta actually to um, uh, if by by step majita chilo study. She that by bits, S bits, S bits study that the highest IVIG on catch core and actually can amadian immunoglobulin level com thaga sepsis patient they should not try to call a hustle S bits. My is this is negative trial. A thin number of me bolbo jacanje immune checkpoint innovation jita jita program cell death ligation one bam rajita cancer patient that they keep catch core with a prevent color genoito my initial small study shows my beneficial. Um, can do it a larger study darker. I'm not any vitamin C, uh, thiamine and uh, hydrocortisone combination doesn't work uh, after the vitamin trial. Last cut, I mean, Bolbo, Jita Oche, um, MRSC PCR, de escalation of Kothajita Bolam Barba, Jaitabam, the Kachko clinical factor, Taprocha, duration seven, eight days mostly, unless it's fungal infection or if it is, you know, viral, that is different duration of treatment. Uh, in the other, otherwise eight days, in the, the blood culture is positive high, I'm bold with our visit, I don't know how to a longer duration like the parade, line sepsis. Kin to I'm bold with the MRSC PCA to important in a way that it will, if we, if we think the source of sepsis is pneumonia, I'm not the MRSC PCA to go in nasal swab, I mean, it is negative, I'm not bold with the parade, MRSC is not the culprit for the sepsis. Among uh, MRSC, it is positive or high? She can get only 30% chance that it actually MRSA causing the pneumonia. I mean, negative actually telling you 
to discontinue uh, MRS antibiotics um, uh, if it is source of infection is pneumonia, not for others. If it's line sepsis, but another source of infection, probably MRS PCR is not the good way to rule out. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, and I'm really impressed with the, all the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tasbir, for summarizing some of the important points. I'm going to move on to Dr. Mohammed Tabriz, who is our infectious disease specialist in the panelist. Then I'm going to invite Dr. Habibur Rahman Lulu to give his comments. Dr. Tabriz, uh, please, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Aisha. Um, first of all, um, you know, there are three speakers. All of them are obviously uh, did a very excellent job. Dr. Firoz, um, you know, talked about the sepsis and the controversies. There's a lot of controversies and it goes up and down. You know, what was right yesterday, it proves to be wrong today. And what is wrong today, it proves to be right tomorrow. That's how it has been for the 20 years that I've been practicing. So um, Dr. Firoz, um, you know, topics, I'm not the expert in that. Dr. Raman and Dr. Tazwir and yourself are, you know, more... Um, Sweet to you know comment on that. One thing that I would like to comment on his uh, presentation is the um, you know the surviving sepsis campaign 2016 guideline was not endorsed by Infectious Disease Society of America as a whole. The reason is, you know, in that update, they uh, mandated that the antibiotic should be broad spectrum antibiotic, not only just antibiotic, broad spectrum antibiotic covering gram positive, gram negative, and sometimes even other coverage should be given within the first hour. That created a lot of controversy and overuse of antibiotic. An example would be if a patient comes to the emergency department and the time is ticking, especially in the US, and it's not that much probably in, um, in, uh, uh, applicable in Bangladesh situation. However, if you start giving antibiotic because of the, the 60 minutes mm -hmm. timeline, then it shows that you, know, you use over uh, antibiotic unnecessarily. So that's where the IDS actually defer endorsing that um, you know, um, guideline. The IDS recommend that you should not say within one hour, you should say promptly. That's my comment in his presentation. About um, Dr. Fatema and Dr. Kaniz, I cannot express my gratitude and you know, I'm kind of so impressed because I have been practicing infectious disease for 20 years and I think you summarize better than what I could do. Uh, in that short time. I'm, I'm, I mean it. I mean, you touch everything that needed to be talked. And each of these slides probably can be elaborated for hours. So my um, summary of um, the antibiotic harm and its antibiotic stewardship would be, if you give me a few minutes, about two, three minutes, the harm is lot. You know, the way I teach infectious disease to my residents and students is um, I have presented in PHA in the past that 5D, you know, each D stands for something. If you keep in your mind, you'll be able to implement antibiotic sourceship in a bedside when you are seeing a patient. The five Ds are numbered. One D is very important, which is diagnosis. As Dr. Fatima and Dr. Khan is both you, in, you know, uh, said in your slides that it is important to recognize you don't treat fever with antibiotic. You don't treat leukocytosis with antibiotic. You don't treat procalcitonin, infiltrate. You treat the patient to get a better outcome. You can use antibiotic and make it like a culture negative, it doesn't mean that it improves the clinical outcome. On the other hand, if you don't treat, it doesn't mean that patient will have a bad outcome. That's number one. Important is diagnosis clinical with some diagnostic modality, differentiate between colonization and infection and so on. Number two, the D is the drug. As you mentioned, choosing antibiotic is important. So we do that by host factors and microbiology factor. Without going into details, you touch all those areas too. You need to know your local antibiogram. You need to know the host factor, recent antibiotic use, hospitalization, comorbidity, immunosuppression. All these factors are important to choose your antibiotic. And also, where is the infection? You need to know the normal flora, what bacteria lives in GI tract, what bacteria we expect in a patient coming from community, things like that. That's your number two drug. And, you know, number three, D is, um, you know, you choose appropriate dose. 
as you mentioned, the septic shock patient has a volume of distribution is different. On the other hand, if the patient is in advanced septic shock, the patient is in renal failure, you know, um, hepatotoxicity and things like that, that patient might be a little bit different. In a study that was shown that patient with acute kidney injury, if in septic shock, they're different than somebody who has a chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease. So that patient, you may not need to worry about adjustment in the first 24, 48 hours. You give the loading dose, you do the extended infusion for um, you know, high resistance or high MIC patient you know, the organism. You could do all of those things. That's number three. Number uh, four is duration. It is very important. You know, problem is in a septic shock patient or sepsis, it's not the problem to initiate the antibiotic. You go ahead and initiate the antibiotic. The problem is many times physicians and the team are afraid of stopping it. That is the problem. You know, when I see a patient in the intensive care unit and I'm told by the resident, we started neuropen and vancomycin and blah, whatever. I said, okay, fine, patient is in septic shock. You are running out of the time, go ahead. And but in 24, 48 hours, you reassess and deescalate. And there are many, many methods one of them, the procalcitonin, but I'm not going to go into details, but I would like to stress here, procalcitonin is not like, you know, the most or only parameters that you need to make a decision about de-escalation. You have to understand the biology of the procalcitonin and it can be induced by cardiogenic shock, trauma, burn, and other things. So you need to be able to differentiate whether the procalcitonin is truly from a septic shock or it could be a combination or it could be a non-infectious ideology. In the duration, there are many, many studies, including that you mentioned, um, uh, Chester in 2003 showed eight days versus 15 days. And then UTI, complicated UTI study has shown you can do seven days even with bacteremia as opposed to 14 days. Intra-abdominal infection, stop it trial uh, showed that if you use four days of antibiotic after source is controlled, you would be fine as opposed to eight days or 14 days and so on. Dr. Tazbir, Tazbir they mentioned about the MRSA. I know Bardem does not do that, but some private hospital in Bangladesh does MRSA PCR in the NARS. If the PCR is negative, negative predictive value is about 97%. So I think the Bardem and all the major teaching hospitals should acquire that MRSA PCR test. It will help to deescalate for MRSA coverage. And important is therapeutic dose monitoring of, um, you know, vancomycin and so on. I get the first cough, okay, <laughs> I'm almost there. Um, so that's about the duration. So the duration, there's many, many studies shows the shorter is better, but bacteremia with MRSA or staph or yes, per se, candidemia require four weeks, sometimes six weeks of therapy. We need to know where we need to extend the therapy. Complications with empyema require longer course and so on. Finally, um, you know, the, um, the antibiotic stewardship has component, but I would just give some suggestion. In Bangladesh, I think the challenge is, is having, you know, local antibiogram. The Bardem and Chittagong Medical is not the same. You need to have your local antibiogram, improve microbiology, molecular study, and so on. So that's my summary of today. I think you, all of you have done wonderful, excellent job, despite not having an ID um, uh, specific uh, you know, training. Thank you so much again. I'd like to work with you both of you in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Tabriz. Um, Dr. Tabriz is extremely resourceful and Amrajita Boli, Jakebare Walking Infectious Disease book. Uh, that's Dr. Tabriz. So thank you so much for your input. And talking about walking encyclopedia is my good friend, Dr. Habibur Rahman Lulu. I'm going to invite a short comment from you. He's the speaker in the next segment, but Dr. Habibur Rahman Lulu, I would like to invite you, uh, your comment as panelist for this section. Thank you so much, Dr. Habibur Dr. Rahman. Rashad, thank you again uh, for giving me the preference for a short comment. Um, you know, after the comments made by Dr. Tabriz about uh, Dr. Uh, Fatima and Dr. Kanish Fatima, both of them did excellent jobs. I really don't have much to add to that. I just want to make some brief remark on the uh, the critical care part, Dr. Uh, Firoz Bhai, and the subsequent uh, remarks made um, by my brothers. You see, one of the problem is, to a large extent is, you know, is our love of numbers. We love numbers, we don't understand the numbers are numbers, we gotta go beyond the numbers and look at the totality of the physiology. And this is really in many cases is a burden, it's a problem rather than a solution. 
I'll just mention a few things. For example, lactate. You know from the physiology, we cannot talk too much now, limited. Anything, everything, catecholamines, cortisol, glucagon, whatever, everything goes up. All the counterregulatory goes up. They're going to cause excessive glycolysis. Whenever you have, go, go back to the Indian marrow pathway, excess lactate production is going to be converted into um, excess by, um, pyruvic acid form, uh, formation is going to be converted into lactate. So lactate can be high, not necessarily classic type A physiology, but the tissue perfusion is a factor. If you see your patient is getting better, you know, mentation is better, capillary perfusion is better, making urine, then lactate has to be understood in the context. And there are many other mechanisms, you know, redox changes and, you know, intercellular microelements, a lot of things that affect lactate. So that's about the lactate. Regarding the mean arterial pressure, generally speaking, what has been suggested is correct. But remember, what is the purpose of the blood pressure? The purpose of the blood pressure is to perfuse the vital organs. If your global assessment tells you the organ is being perfused, and you can look at all levels, then you determine in an individual patient's. Whenever we throw a fixed number for an elderly person pre-existing hypertension, which is to some extent true, we are likely to be wrong. And in critical care, our scope of doing mistake is very limited. We have to be very cautious about not doing any kind of mistake as much as possible. Even the leg raising test, which is a beautiful test, and I like it. The cardiac output goes, you see it, you know, 13, 15% differences. So fine, you give some volume. Still, you have to ask yourself, do I need a greater cardiac output in this patient? It simply means that the frank is styling curve of the heart where it can take some preload and can pump it out forward. Does it mean that the patient's physiology needs it? That is the question we have to ask. And these days, especially with the bedside point of care ultrasound, you can have lots of data and examine the patient. You can make a much more specific decisions without causing more, much harm to the patients. And just quickly, in a cytosorb and IBIG and even the checkpoint inhibitors, they are not so far. There is no promise there, as a matter of fact. And I'll be very cautious about the checkpoint when you're changing the system, you're changing the proportion of the T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes, et cetera, without understanding the you know, holistic physiology that the patient is going through, we are very likely to cause harm. And we know that all the studies, however small they are, none of them really showed positive outcome, except maybe a small study on checkpoint inhibitors. I think that's all I had to say for the sake of time, but this is a topic that probably I could talk about hours, and there is so much really, I think, is very, very relevant to our practice in everyday life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Habibur Rahman Lulu. And I, it's truly a privilege of my lifetime to be working with my esteemed US colleagues and from the colleagues in Bangladesh. I really appreciate uh, Professor Shahira Khatun Bela for her valuable time. Thank you so much, speakers and panelists. I'm going to move on to the second segment of today's webinar. Um, so today's webinar uh, is actually the second of a two-day webinar on the critical care challenges of 2021. I would like to thank Mahbub from PHA for his tremendous support for the success of this program. The panelists today were the Professor Titumia. Uh, Professor Titumia is a principal of Dhaka Medical College. Unfortunately, he's in a meeting with government officials ongoing right now regarding the COVID situation in Bangladesh. Uh, the other panelists is Dr. Hamidu Zaman, Dr. Raihan Rabbani from Square Hospital um, ICU in Bangladesh, um, Dr. Tazbirul Islam, and I would like to invite also comments from uh, Dr. Habibur Rahman at the end. Um, there are some uh, very important people in the audience today. Dr. Adnan Yusuf Choudhury, I see Dr. Roshni Jahan, Professor Fokrun Nesa and others. I will invite your comments at the end as well. So let's move on to the second segment. Very important seg is we talked about antibiotic harm, but uh, and Tabriz, if you will also stay on as a panelist for the next segment, we will really appreciate it. Um, so we talked about the um, harm of antibiotics and at Chakush Praman, Ekuni Amra Dekchi in Southeast Asia, which is the fungal super infection or the mucormycosis. So our good friend Tariq Reza, 
who is the assistant, who is an assistant professor of critical care medicine, Tariq has tremendous experience in Dhaka Medical College, especially during the first wave, Jakun Akebare system ta dumre muchere bhenge porchilo. He's currently the head of ICU and high uh, dependency unit at DNCC COVID designated hospital in Dhaka. Dr. Tariq Reza is going to talk about fungal super infection, mucormycosis, the Bangladeshi experience. Tariq, we are very excited to have you as our, our speaker. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Asha Manan and uh, uh, Good evening from Bangladesh. Uh, uh, respected my uh, senior teachers, professors, uh, panelists, experts, and also my colleagues and uh, friends. Uh, uh, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, deliver my speech uh, regarding the mycomycosis or superfungal infection in a critical care setting. It is a hot topic in nowadays. And I would like to thank the Plenary Healthcare Academia to uh, arrange such a wonderful program. And first of all, I would, uh, I would like to uh, share my uh, presentation. Slide share Yes. Uh, am I uh, visible and audible? Yes. Okay, thank you. So the fungal super uh, infection, the Bangladesh experience, uh, actually the fungal infection is uh, before the COVID era, uh, we are not uh, so much aware about the fungal uh, infection in our country. The, the fungal infections are uh, sporadically identified in uh, different hospital and mostly in the uh, tertiary care hospital where the, um, uh, those who are uh, post-graduation doctor uh, teaching institutes, they are uh, uh, identified uh, several fungal infections, especially the deep fungal infections uh, uh, by uh, different techniques. So uh, the uh, fungal infection, uh, uh, Actually, the fungal, uh, fungal infection is common in our country because the most of the fungal infections, superficial fungal infection, which is very much common in uh, our climate, climate condition. But uh, today we are concerned and discuss about the uh, invasive fungal infection, which are now uh, increasing uh, day by day in uh, our country uh, because the number of uh, fungal, uh, uh, th these fungal infections are actually they are associated with the, the critically ill patients and the number of critically ill patients are increasing day by day. The reason behind these are the there is increased population of immunocompromised individuals because uh, the, for the last uh, 10 to 15 years uh, due to the uh, several interventions and procedures and number of ICU beds are increasing and also uh, they are uh, in our country now that different transplantations and different uh, procedures like um, uh, renal replacement therapies are going on. And not only in the, um, uh, the Dhaka city and also in other city, uh, the, uh, the number of ICU uh, renal uh, replacement therapy and other procedures are increasing day by day. So the more aggressive medical intervention and procedures, immunocompromised patients, both are increasing. And another thing is that uh, the antibacterial therapy use is also increasing. And uh, due to the indiscriminate use of antibacterial therapy, there definitely there is a chance of increasing the fungal infection in our country. So in uh, just shortly, the, what, is the, what is fungus? The fungus are you carriers. Uh, definitely they have membranes and organelles and they are different from the bacteria uh, which are also called prokaryotes. They have rigid cell wall but uh, this cell wall also containing some structure that is uh, sitting mandan and these uh, structures are very important for the diagnosis of uh, fungal infection in different 
uh, techniques. And the simplest classification, there are uh, various classification, but the simplest classification, you all know that they can be uh, classified uh, into molds and uh, yeast. And yeast are the round dead cells that can bud and molds demonstrate stranded filamental appearance uh, caused by hyphae. Some, fun uh, some, uh, some fungi maybe uh, have both form, they are dimorphic. Some yeast can develop pseudo hyphae and some can produce the matted intermesh network that is called mycelium. The risk factor is very much important because we all know that the invasive fungal infection is associated with some risk factor uh, because uh, the fungus is ubiquitous in our environment, but it uh, cannot produce any infection, uh, infection in human body if there is some predisposing factor or risk factor. And importantly, the immunocompromised host, and there is a uh, list of immunocompromised host, and definitely the all are uh, now present in uh, our country setting because uh, that chemotherapy, neutropenia, the diabetes, renal hemodialysis, burn malnutrition, and malignancy, and the treatment of malignancy like uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy are uh, common uh, treatment modalities in our country. So number of immunocompromised along with uh, immunocompromised patients, there are some patients that are also fibrosis, bronchitis, and as I previously mentioned, the invasive also increases. The number of ICU and ICU beds are increasing day by day. Uh, for In the last two to five years, uh, the number of ICU and ICU beds uh, are increasing about uh, five to 10 folds. And uh, after, other than Dhaka, in different district hospitals, they also have ICU beds and also ventilator and uh, some devices. And our doctors are uh, now uh, trained up and they are uh, with uh, some uh, procedures like um, uh, central venous lines, uh, catheterization device, uh, these are uh, implantable prosthetic device. These are now common practice and common uh, treatment modalities in our country. And definitely there are some generalized uh, immunosuppressive conditions like uh, IV drug abuse, or there may be some uh, injuries, including fecal pain. The clinical feature of uh, fungal infection is uh, it is important in the sense that uh, the diagnosis is uh, sometimes is difficult and uh, there should be high level of suspicion for the diagnosis of uh, fungal infection in uh, our patients because uh, most of the patients uh, our symptoms are non-specific, generally inflammatory symptoms like pyrexia, tachycardia, which can occur in any viral and bacterial infection are most common, specific, organ-specific, um, symptoms and signs are less common. And in immunocompromised patients, these the, the main uh, group of people, uh, those are vulnerable to fungal infection. Uh, the white cell count are often unhelpful. And cutaneous stigmata, which are very uh, much important for diagnosis of uh, fungal infection, are also very much uncommon. So a high index of suspicions is required to identify the fungal infection. Uh, it is very much important uh, because definitely the delay in the diagnosis that caused the delay in the treatment has the worst outcome. The diagnostic technique and all, uh, also different from uh, other viral and bacterial infection, the fungi and fungal tissue uh, are sometimes directly can be identified by the microscope, which is the common uh, practice of a diagnosis of fungal infection in our country, but there is some special uh, culture can, uh, uh, keep, can be done to identify the fungal. And in some cases, the biopsy of the affected organ uh, can be helpful for diagnosis of fungal infection. The special test is very important for the diagnosis of fungal infection. This may include the uh, PCR technique for the uh, detection of the fungal DNA, the galactomannan, 
which is uh, ingredient of aspergillus species are also important for diagnosis and uh, inflammatory markers uh, these are not so much helpful and they are non specific and procalcitonin might have low sensitivity for the invasive fungal infection there are different diagnostic technique for individual group of fungal infection uh, from the candidiasis to up to cryptococcus blastomycosis and also other fungal infection the uh, set of investigations panel are different uh, of for the different uh, group of fungal infection and the, uh, the, there is a uh, limitation in our uh, context because the this investigations facilities are not readily available in uh, uh, some areas and so sometimes the high level of transmission clinical diagnosis uh, which uh, is very much difficult uh, is the only uh, guide for the diagnosis of fungal infection in our country so what is the uh, bangladeshi studies regarding the uh, fungal infection uh, there is a, a excellent study of fungal infection regarding the burden of uh, serious fungal infection in bangladesh uh, which is uh, published in the uh, e european journal of uh, microbiology and uh, the this journal showed that the superficial mycosis definitely this is the very common and of the superficial mycosis the trichophyton is the prominent etiological agent and in some cases the mycotic keratitis also the common uh, the superficial or surface fungal infection in our country but the deep fungal infection by invasive fungal infection uh, in that case the number of identity, identified case is small the candida blood free uh, blood stream infection was estimated uh, based on five per lot rate uh, should be uh, 8100 cases and histoplasmosis was documented in 16 cases and uh, 21 was associated with hiv infection pneumocystis pneumonia and cryptococcal meningitis are not uh, so much common is very much rare diagnosed there there is a excellent case reports of uh, six fungal infection a different type of fungal infection in the journal of medicine in 2010 and uh, the expert panel they diagnose a different fungal infection a different type of fungal infection and the uh, the first case was the histoplasmosis which is a, a 57 years old male non diabetic non normotensive a smoker and he had the history of the backache and progressive weakness and constipation and urinary irritation uh, definitely these are common feature of uh, spastic uh, paraplegia and uh, he also had the sensory loss up to the level of um, d10 uh, he is he had generalized lymphadenopathy and anemic and also have hepatomegaly so the primary investigations including <coughs> x ray and mri suggest that uh, uh, this may uh, is the our common uh, infection that is tuberculosis the bone tb which is very much common in our country so the initial diagnosis is definitely the, uh, the tuberculosis or malignancy uh, according to the x ray and radiological finding and there is also some uh, normocytic normochromic anemia and raise the sn rolex formation definitely which uh, are in favor of tuberculosis but the open biopsy of the paravertebral soft tissue showed that this is the case of histoplasmosis another is interesting cases in uh, bangabandhu sheikh mujib medical university there is uh, which is a diagnosed case of abdominal tuberculosis definitely he has the fever abdominal pain jaundice and some uh, constitutional symptom including the generalized lymphadenopathy which is also common in uh, tuberculosis disseminated tuberculosis or abdominal tuberculosis but uh, the one thing is that there is a, a, a ulcer in the heart palate which is rounded and ulcer ulcerated and then after biopsy it showed that actually this is a case of histoplasmosis the third case uh, 
is a 50 years old male smoker and presented with the X-ray with homogeneous opacity in the left upper zone and fever for and dry cough for about three months and also an opacity in the chest X-ray. And definitely uh, this might be a case of tuberculosis or a malignancy, which is the, our common first uh, provisional diagnosis. But uh, the sputum show the inflammatory cells with some fungal yeast and hyphae and the percutaneous lung aspiration shows that this is a case of uh, blastomycosis. The mucormycosis already diagnosed in 2004 in BSMMU and uh, a 42 years old male who have a long-term uh, steroid therapy for the uh, bone marrow uh, failure. Uh, he developed uh, left orbital sweating, swelling and blindness uh, along with prolonged fever. The neurological examination also some uh, features like apoptosis and tosis and periorbital <coughs> edema. And there is also a total ophthalmopedia with dilated uh, pupil on the left side and impaired uh, sensation of distribution of the trisaminal nerve. There is an oscillation of the lip and crust formation. And um, um, by the high suspicion, the, after the histopathology uh, from the nasal mucosa uh, shows that this is a case of mycormycosis. Another case of mycomycosis uh, has been uh, had diagnosed in uh, 1994. Uh, she, she was a 22 years old housewife, a known case of ITP. Uh, this young lady also had the history of prolonged uh, steroid therapy and also had low grade fever and swelling of the left side of the face. And after examination, there is an ulcer, a sharp margin on the heart palate. And he also saw some neurological uh, findings. And so Hi. after the histopathology, it showed that uh, the features are consistent with mycormycosis. <clears throat> Another case of diagnosis is the aspergilloma, which is a 70 years old male, uh, normotensis spoker. This is diagnosis DMCS in uh, 2009. He, uh, he had complained, uh, he had cough, respiratory distress, low grade fever, and uh, some chest pain for about two months. He had a past history of tuberculosis and on examination, he has a cavitary lesion uh, in the lung and the test x and CT scan uh, show a crescentic rim surrounding the mass. A CT guided FNSC uh, confirmed that this is a case of aspergilloma. So, uh, uh, in our country, uh, there are def def definitely different types of case report regarding the um, different type of fungal infection. But uh, in ICU settings, uh, especially the candida and different type of candida species is very much common. But uh, due to lack of the investigation facilities, sometimes it is uh, overlooked. So the, um, the actual scenario of the candida infection, invasive candida infection, is not uh, fully known. And in our uh, neighborhood in the subcontinent, the uh, candida infection uh, is common. And ab uh, among the candida infection, the non albigan candida species are the most common infection of uh, invasive candida infection in ICU settings. And a different study from both in the uh, South and North India, they showed that the candida is common and also the uh, non envigal candidas uh, like um, candida, other than candida albicans, uh, these are the most common uh, cause and the risk factors of this infection is definitely the uh, immunosuppressive condition like diabetes, steroid therapy, and also uh, the long-term antibiotic therapy is one of the important cause of this uh, candida infection in their settings. So there is a different observational study uh, regarding the candida infection in our neighboring countries. <coughs> and now the outbreak of fungal infection, which is the main concern in nowadays in our neighboring country and also in Bangladesh, that is the, the mycormycosis uh, outbreak is, the, uh, it already had occurred uh, in some part of the India and this outbreak of uh, fungal infection is not so much uncommon because and previously the, uh, the outbreak of infection uh, are 
identified and most of them are associated with the healthcare associated fungal infection and candida oris uh, is the most common cause of uh, this outbreak of fungal infection in different intensive care unit and recently due to the covid-19 infection the mycomycosis uh, outbreak uh, are occurred in different part of india so mm -hmm. the, in the covid-19 situation we face the double problem regarding the covid-19 uh, infection associated with uh, different type of super infection both the bacteria and fungus so covid-19 infection spread which now in a, a global pandemic are potentially a source of fungal infection uh, in a different part of the world and in different study in different uh, article it already showed that the fungal infection is much more common in uh, covid-19 era and in in this study uh, as uh, of out of uh, 135 adult patient in the icu on covid-19 27% uh, developed the fungal infection so the number of fungal infection is increasing uh, day by day uh, due to uh, the immunosuppressive condition of uh, covid-19 and also its uh, medication so candida oris infection already occurred in uh, outbreak already occurred in uh, august 2020 so both the um, uh, black fungus that is mycosis candida and different type of fungal infection may uh, outbreak may occur in different part of the world uh, due to covid-19 situation the thank you covid-19 situation uh, the Not only at, uh, in uh, India and on other country like Brazil, uh, Guatemala, Mexico, Peru, they also have uh, incidence of COVID in, uh, infection with fungal infection in their country. So, in our neighboring country, the there are a, a series of uh, uh, outbreak of COVID uh, uh, fungal infection in uh, different times, and. there are a different study regarding the outbreak of candidemia and other fungal infection in intensive care unit so the black fungal infection uh, epidemic uh, now a uh, epidemic in uh, india and it is very worry worrisome because uh, already the 7200 people already infected and uh, of whom the two, uh, 219 are already died so the most common cause of this uh, fungal infection in covid-19 is uh, the definitely the oxygen therapy in the icu and the use of humidifier uh, they uh, recommend that the sterile water must be used uh, we, which we should be also be concerned regarding the uh, uh, while we are using that oxygen in our humidifier with our humidifier and another important thing is the voriconazole therapy which is sometimes uh, occur uh, empirically for to treat the fungal infection and it is also a, a predisposing factor for mycomycosis uh, in uh, mycomycosis epidemic in bangladesh there is uh, uh, in bardem they, they identified two uh, black fungal infection uh, and it, it already reported in a different newspaper also uh, and they successfully identified that uh, uh, confirm this uh, mycomycosis from their patient and this patient are recovered from covid-19 uh, yeah another uh, blood mm, fungus infection of also coming to, to interrupt kori uh, you have one minute left okay uh, another fung uh, bug fungal infection uh, already diagnosed in uh, dhaka medical college hospital which is a 45 years male also have diabetes He is diagnosed and uh, treated covid positive in uh, in medical college uh, and also some uh, for uh, admitted in dhaka medical college and by histopathology confirmed as a, a mycomycosis so early detection is very much important to identify the uh, fungal epidemic in our country and definitely the most common uh, source of infection uh, 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 is the uh, we should uh, have the preventive measure like hand hygiene transmission transmission based precaution and cleaning and dis infection is the important to prevent this type of fungal in epidemic in our country thank you thank you so much tarik ekebari heroic kaj bolte hobe 
কারণ ফাঙ্গাল ইনফেকশন আমরা মাত্র লার্ন করছি আমরা মানে কেউই এটার মাস্টার না কিন্তু ইউ ডিড এন এক্সেলেন্ট জব প্রচন্ড প্রচন্ড চাপ আমি জানি তোমার উপর দিয়েছি বিকজ ইটস আ কন্টেম্পোরারি সাবজেক্ট থ্যাংক ইউ সো মাচ অ্যান্ড উই উইল হিয়ার কমেন্টস ফ্রম দ্য প্যানেলিস্ট অ্যাট দ্য এন্ড উই হ্যাভ টু মোর স্পিকার্স ডক্টর লুনিক সর্দার হি ইজ গোয়িং টু টক অ্যাবাউট ইন্টিগ্রেটেড আইসিইউ অ্যাপ্রোচ খুব বার্নিং একটা ইস্যু ইনিশিয়াল ম্যানেজমেন্ট অফ সেপটিক শক ইন দ্য ইমার্জেন্সি রুম হি ইজ আ কনসালটেন্ট ইমার্জেন্সি মেডিসিন ফিজিশিয়ান অ্যাট কুইন্স হসপিটাল অ্যাট বি এর HR University Hospital at UK. This will be followed by Dr. Habibur Rahman Lulu, who's going to talk also about super infection in the ICU. So thank you for um, sticking around. Um, I will turn over to Dr. Lunik Shardar, who had tremendous commitments today and still has been waiting patiently for his lineup. Thank you very much, Dr. Lunik Shardar. Uh, thank you Apu, for uh, this kind introduction and inviting me in this amazing program where the uh, distinguished world authority in sepsis and ICE were here. Uh, can you hear me, by the way? Yes, yes. Right. Can you see my slide? Yes, thank you. Right. So my name is Leonik. Uh, in Bangladesh, people in the school, they know me as Ziroli. I'm from Solimula Medical College um, in 2014. batch. Um, I'm also involved in teaching. I'm teaching resuscitation module and in a master's program in Queen Mary and a significant portion of this is dealing with sepsis. So I'll try to uh, say a few things um, that I think is important. So today's objective in next 20 minutes would be I'll try to focus on some importance of sepsis in public health, just one slide. And then I'll focus on the recognition and categorization of sepsis because in emergency department, we deal with undifferentiated patient. So first thing is, is sepsis or not sepsis is more important than treating sepsis. And then I'll focus on sepsis six that the very old known phenomenon we still stick with and what modification we have achieved in the United Kingdom. And then I'll talk about the, particular, the practicality and delivering sepsis treatment in our department And then I will try to touch the Bangladesh perspective and sepsis management. So talking about the public health um, issues, just give an idea. So sepsis is one of the leading cause in death in UK. And in current data, our severe sepsis mortality is 35%, which is five times more than ST elevation MI or any stroke. In pre-pandemic data, In pre-pandemic data, I'm not including COVID, there are 52,000 deaths and 60,000 disability in United Kingdom. And in precisely in, in, in England, not United Kingdom is around 34,000. And out of our 110 billion pounds UK budget, it cost us 15.6 billion pound. The reason I'm trying to convert into Taka, um, that comes like that, I'm not sure I'm, not, I'm correct or not. So we physicians and clinicians, we detect our patient's mortality by emotion and um, hospital authority uh, statisticians look at number and the policymakers and the government or who de de decrease these funds, release these funds go by numbers. If we'd delivered the right practice, we could say 14,000 life, which is a huge thing and 2.8 billion um, GBP per year. So, we have to do something and something been done. Um, the UK has UK sepsis trust. And because Royal College of Emergency Physicians deal the initial um, treatment, so we work together. So three things they came up with. The first thing is early recognition. This uh, highlighted area actually I put it um, as I think is early categorization also very important. Second thing is urgent intervention. And third thing is time de-escalation. So these three things to focus uh, for better outcome an emergency department. Now, when you talk about early recognition, I'm not going to talk about that, but um, this is sometimes difficult in settings like Bangladesh because we do not know who is seeing this patient, how we diagnose confusion or drowsiness and the, and the seniority of this clinician or the nurses. We don't have the blood results. We may not have the glucometer. 
which is very difficult sometimes. Of course, we know about this sofa, key sofa. Of course, you can use any of those. But the first speaker I can remember mentioned about news and now is news too, which is phenomenal because this is the early warning score for any illness and when it's progressing. So it's not only sepsis. So why so in between these three, SIRS, sofa Q, sofa slash news, we can use any of them, of course. And of course, news is more broad. But if you think that you can smell any, any infection going on and high news, you have to consider sepsis. So this, if you see this recognition, the aggregator score five to six, um, then you have to consider is going that way. Now, what I want to say after my, when I finish my talk, I will send you lots of toolkits and lots of papers, including the sepsis tools guideline and all, and my presentation, if you're interested, you can download in the chat box and you can download from here. So the question is what? SIRS QSO for news to use. Now uh, it's golden paper. One of our uh, leading scientists from uh, Royal Liverpool Hospital ran a study um, in 1819. Um, he uh, got 1800, almost 1,800 patients were all sepsis, 52 went to ITU, uh, a significant mortality rate. In their study, with good power and statistically valuable, I'll send you the paper anyway, it shows news actually not inferior to the other two. So we tried in Solimula Medical College to introduce the new scoring system and uh, other things, but the question is, when you're talking about Bangladesh, if it's in general as everywhere we could use, introduce this, that could be helpful. The second point I say is categorization. Yes, sepsis, sepsis, sepsis infection, but are we categorizing them initially? Because are we highlighting, are we flagging up that who needs what? So yes, if patient got SRS or high news, you're thinking infection, we are talking about sepsis. Now, this severe sepsis with the element of uh, a organ dysfunction criteria, are we actually always asking ourselves when seeing a patient, a query is a severe sepsis, is organ dysfunction is there or not? Their mortality is around 35% in the UK. Is there any shock criteria, is a septic shock? So as soon as the patient walked in, before I approach the patient, there's a highlight, is sepsis or not? And my job would be severe or sepsis or septic shock, or my colleagues will be working together. We're not alone ever. So I'm just taking you a few lines just to talk about the severe sepsis and septic shock. So severe sepsis is, of course, the presence of sepsis and organ dysfunction criteria. Now, if you have chest x-ray uh, in proximity and you can say that saturation is low and we require oxygen, of course, it's a lung sepsis. So one organ is involved and not function is severe sepsis. Like that, again, uh, Lulu Bhai kindly said, absolutely agree. God knows how many salbutamol patient has received or how much metformin patient is on or other medications. Or there's so many factors. But if it's a fresh... Um, young patient, no past medical history, sometimes cryptogenic shock, cytopathic shock is sometimes helpful. Renal functions, a point of care, blood test is important. Uh, synthetic function of liver, bone marrow depression, suppression, these are important. So any elements of detection of organ suppression or malfunction or, or not performing well, we can say is a severe sepsis. Other than just saying pneumonia, it's pneumonia with severe sepsis. Um, Again, the shock criteria. Uh, I was uh, listening about this uh, fluid uh, agreement and discussion, which is, I agree with all. Um, lactate, of course, I consider whether uh, there's no other factors involved, uh, but fluid wise, I must say one thing, uh, any patient without known um, heart failure or should like, look like picky and big puffy face. And I got one tools that many others in Bangladesh may not have is an ultrasound. This is my stethoscope. So within moments, I can tell how is the ejection fraction, how is the intravena cava, is it pulmonary edema there or not? I decide in moments. But if the patient eventually, you know, hyperdynamic heart with a kissing inferior vena cava, I have no problem to give 30 ml that I do, which is if you see, consider if it's a man, a uh, woman around 70 kg of weight, 30 ml is actually two liters of fluid. It's a shame like knowing that heart is fun, you know, pumping very well and your peripherally is it dilated or whatever, 
but your vena cava is collapsed. You're calling the critical care, giving optimum fluid resuscitation, um, probably is not fair. But of course, if the vena cava is distended, I'm not going to push 30 ml. Is again, we are not treating the number, we are treating the patient and the situation there. So first of all, to determine this is a sepsis. Second is a severe sepsis or is a septic shock. And that determine who to highlight, who to flag up and what to treat. Lactate is a key area, but again, it varies. So mainly in young patients who got um, compensated shock and or cryptogenic shock, uh, lactate value helps. Um, so I, I feel the point of care blood test, blood analyzer in every any department in Bangladesh should be important. Another thing um, we, we really consider here is red flag sepsis. I'll show you the kit and I'll show you the proforma, but three things in my trust we do. Any patient coming in with heart rate more than 130 or respiratory rate more than 25 and less than alert is red flag. So in that sort of patient from triage or raft with a rapid assessment and focus treatment room, either specialty trainee three plus or anyone above um, someone who actually S3 means they have the core competencies and they are um, uh, post Royal College membership uh, positive, they will see the patient and consider the treatment. So that's place in there. Unless he documented it didn't happen. So someone with a right global lobe pneumonia with no signs of sepsis and someone with light lobe pneumonia with hypoxia with someone with right lobe pneumonia with a shock with non-responding to fluid, all are pneumonias, but a pneumonia with severe sepsis, pneumonia with uncomplicated sepsis, pneumonia with septic shock, this bit logo, a diagnostic marker or a sticker make a huge difference in patients and doctors and nurses attitude towards this patient and the importance of the, how will you treat and when? And I think this is, this is, this is something we must, must, must consider and I, I do. And we are failing even in our trust to focus this and highlight this well. Now, the point, the treatment of sepsis that Apu kindly requested me to, but I think when it's a treatment as emergency physician, our job is to, differ, to find the undifferentiated patient and recognize as well. So I took that much time to say that about this. We know about sepsis six, um, take three, give three, right? So when we take three or give three, giving oxygen, giving fluids, giving antibiotics, we're taking three things, taking blood culture, taking blood test, taking urine. Now, as emergency physician in one of the most advanced emergency department in Europe, um, I would say, when we say administer high flow oxygen, for me, high flow oxygen, not necessarily just oxygen, could be nasal cannuli, could be normal uh, face mask, could be venturi, could be non rebreather mask, could be, uh, CPAP could be BiPAP, could be RSI and total um, taking control of the airway. So oxygen means oxygen. Second is blood culture. So it is sometimes when the patient is peripherally shut down, we struggle to do the cannula and get the blood uh, for tests and getting access. Uh, it, it unlikely to happen here because we have ultrasound, we can do peripheral. If not, we go for femoral approach. If not, we can do jugular approach. If not, we go IO. So we have this in our hand and nobody will wait long for an access or for blood test. Giving fluid, giving fluid the choice. Uh, yes, Hartman is our choice and we use normal saline as well. Uh, not much any fancy stuff like albumin or anything that had been discussed earlier. And um, guided by patient fluid status, by clinical examination and my ultrasound findings not necessarily depending on the numbers that fluid is this. I, I totally agree with Lulu Bhai and previous speakers and Tanji Bhai, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, that, that exactly we do. Someone mentioned about bloods. Bloods in sepsis, we don't think about that. We think about hemoglobin. Could be heart failure and MI, who knows? Someone got a massive heart failure behaving like high temperature in case bilateral crabs. It could be mixed picture, dual picture, we don't know. So hemoglobin seven, again, in UK, in our department, there's in our, in our hospital, in the local trust, this is the key. We, we don't transfuse uh, by anything else, but the numbers depending on and patient's response to the treatment. 
uh, of course, check, check hemoglobin and serial lactates. Again, serial lactates initially in first few hours, very difficult to say. I have seen many, many times after giving initial fluid, the washout, the lactate goes up uh, with normal saline pH goes down. So it doesn't mean anything, but it's total physiological response. How the patients look like, is it talking better, breathing better, looks, color looks better. This, this, I would say type on thinking like picture is very important. So monitoring. And the lastly is a urinary kit. Uh, we stay to put a catheter in so that we can measure uh, the, all the urine output uh, depending on the treatment and the renal functions. I'm going to the next part, which is the practicality. So to, to support a, and establish a, a service in a three Ps, place, people and process. I got a place, I got the infrastructure, patient comes in within five minutes, I got chest X-ray done. I got patient being changed to a gown, it doesn't matter in which state the patient is. I got cannulas in, I got bloods done, I got ABG in my hand or VVG in my hand in 90 seconds. I got lab bloods result in 10 minutes. So this infrastructure I have, I have these trolleys every corner in my department. And you see this step six, six top to bottom, they know what, what is there. I got people, we got sepsis nurse, sepsis and special, not doctors, but at least two nurse, like football captains wearing an armband, sepsis nurse, and they know as soon as anything, any sepsis come, there's a blip goes off and they are there with their trolley. We've got a sepsis corner. We've got a robust process that how will it work? For an example, this is the toolkit. So as soon as patient comes in and the initial nurse think this is a SIRS positive and think it's a sepsis, and then they can tell that maybe patient telling, talking about urinary symptoms or respiratory symptoms. Um, they're ticking and looking for red flag sepsis. I mentioned earlier, just put three um, um, element there, respiratory rate, um, mental consciousness and saturation. And look at that here, they're a bit more. Any of them positive, they put as a red sepsis call, then a senior doctor register level will come and see the patient and start treatment sepsis six. If there's an ambiguity there, of course, again, senior will see and start treatment. Our aim is to treat within, within one hour and the antibiotic and fluid to start. And this is the element that uh, we use that is given and when, that time, time is key, is a time dependent treatment. And that we follow according to the UK stepsis test and, and us, it's ours a bit modified by the same thing. This is the core and without ultrasound, we are, um, we actually cannot function. Um, a few of us earlier mentioned about CVPs. I'm talking about first 15 minutes, half an hour. Then we decide patient is septic. We decide what category sepsis is this, septic shock or severe sepsis or uncomplicated sepsis. We start initial treatment, initial fluid if required, initial definite antibiotics. But this is the key that guide us in every, every element. The emergency medicine consultants the, in the training program, they cannot be consultant unless you have a level one competencies in ultrasound. So this is again, part of the process that we come across and follow through. I'll talk about last few minutes about Bangladesh perspective. Um, we have two challenges according to the uh, last few speakers and I, I, I came across in Bangladesh, which is the misuse and develop a platform uh, to, for robust management in the healthcare system. I just got this data last night, I was looking, there's a the biggest hit on data in 2019 um, is available and anyone can download, but I'll upload it in the chat box in a minute. So it shows that even in the most developed nations, uh, they are struggling with superbugs. Um, 35,000 people died in, in one year uh, for just super infections. And, this same data shows it can improve that as well, and they're improving. So we have to think how. So I try to look at the data in Bangladesh perspective. I, I got two papers, uh, one from Bangladesh published in UK about the antibiotic resistance in Bangladesh in six districts and 46 units that have been involved. And pretty much everywhere there is a superbug or multi drug resistant bacterial presence. And this paper also very interesting, the contributory factor, I think pretty much all of us by type on thinking, we know why it is happening and how it's happening. 
So I think the treatment of sepsis in Bangladesh perspective starts beyond the hospital or emergency room. We need public awareness about this antibiotic use, the pharmaceuticals behavior, who they advertise to and who they sell their drug and the over-the-counter practice um, that need to be looked at. But again, it's a big social and public health thing that need to be, to be involved uh, to get a proper outcome of sepsis management. Public health and private sector, I'm not sure BMDC or BCPS or DG Health um, embed this in, in the hospitals have some like ALS, APLS, ATLS. It's a sepsis training and the resources, uh, the point of care test, the chest x-rays, ultrasound, blood gas analyzers, and the nursing staff. And of course, at the end is this vigorous audit and quality improvement projects that embedded uh, the structure and the function of the core value of the uh, timely manner of the management of sepsis that is also very important. I'm very happy uh, to take questions. I Sorry, I just rushed through so that to give you a broad picture because emergency physicians don't only treat patients. We Our job starts in pre-hospital, triage, team leading, performing, developing and research. So we have to be a holistic view in any every approach. Um, before I finish, um, the few things it involved earlier, the steroid, yes. If the patient looks like Edisonian, not improving in fluid, hyperkalemia, hyponatremia, unresponsive to fluid, yes, we can give steroid. And if the, the primary condition requires steroid, we give steroid. I mentioned about bloods uh, that we number is seven but not necessarily sepsis or not sepsis. Albumin, the answer is absolute no. Bicarb, we're very sensitive. We don't try to use it, but unless patient is severely, severely acidotic and bicarb like five, six, seven, ten, 10, um, non-responsive or severe AKI, with, with that joint, is joint decision with critical care, we give um, uh, bicarb, but very, very rare, maybe once a month, um, but that's it. And I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rolly. Dr. Lunik Shoddar, uh, for your crystal clear messaging. Uh, fantastic. I forgot um, And thank you for finishing ahead of time. Thank you so much. So uh, how do we monitor adverse event? How do we monitor patient safety? And how do we curb the mortality report, uh, rate in the ICU? It actually starts in the emergency room. So thank you so much for being a part of this webinar. Um, the only thing I can say about myself is the only thing I know, I know nothing. Socrates said that, I didn't say that. So when I get into a difficult situation, I go to my good friend, Dr. Habibur Rahman Lulu, who's the next renowned speaker. And he's going to talk about super infection in the ICU. Thank you participants so much. He's the last speaker, but I, in my opinion, he's, he's the most important speaker. Dr. Habibur Rahman Lulu, please. This will be followed by panel discussion. Thank you. All right, thank you, Aisha Salam, to all of you. <clears throat> I'm gonna begin my 20 minutes marathon race, being the last speaker on quite similar topics. There may be some degree of overlap, and I'll try to avoid it as much as I can. However, I really intend to stress the issue to include a little bit greater context of the growing resistant infection to the point of helpless frustration that we have as clinician and scientist, and uh, which is reminding us our fragmented understanding that brought us here today. So I'll, I'll be mainly focusing on uh, this escape organism today because this is the growing threat. WHO out of its 12 organism included this escape. There's a deliberate mistake here, which is C, it is supposed to be replaced by K. And just let me quickly go over the organism, which you by now you already know. 
Entrococcus facium, Staphylococcus aureus MRSA, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Acinetobacter, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Enterobacteria. These organisms with growing resistance and transfer of resistance across the continents has stood as a biggest threat. And if we cannot overcome this, then we're basically in the pre-1928 era is going to begin soon. So just to give a little bit of context, humanity has traveled a long distance, starting from 17, 1670 with the discovery of the microscope by you know, von Leeuwenhoek, and then down the road. You can see in 1975, you have the DNA array and colony hybridizations. In 1988, you have a fluorescence inside to hybridization. And then in 2005, we have the next generation sequencing, the second generation, and right now we have the third generation sequencing. So we've traveled a long journey. As you can see from the fragmentation and separation, we're slowly coming to understand the whole existence of the biological world is in a way together, interdependent and dynamically interconnecting until and unless we recognize that and shape our science and technology, clinical medicine, and even business, then we are not going to reach our destination or get into more and more trouble. In 2005, you have the first human microbiome project. And then in 2010, you have the Earth microbiome, Earth microbiome project for a good reason, because we are forced to go in that direction. We can, we can see the shift of paradigm where the organism was considered to be a separation or you know, insignificant bugs from a holistic view of interdependence. See, here you see our body has about 1,500 organisms in microbiome, um, cultures and PCR all together, but the number uh, is still underestimated. But if you go to an Aboriginal, their number could be as high as uh, 4,000. And then people living in the cities and exposed to all kinds of modern amenities and drinking water, their numbers are even farther down. Yet we know there's a tremendous interdependence, dynamic interdependence for both health and disease. And just to give you an example, we have all this organism inside our body, but if the body is at rest, mind is at rest, body is at rest, undisturbed, then they tend to cooperate with one another. About 3 million genes from the microbial world interacting with 20 to 24,000 genes of human being and physiologically complementing, and we depend on them. And so we have reached a point where that recognition has become you know, absolutely necessary. So without disturbance of that um, microbiome, you have a mutualistic coevolution. On the other hand, when there is interruption and disturbance, that the same situation become antagonistic. So this leads to this a concept which is now getting more and more popular is the hollow bound concept of the evolution. So what is a microbiome? The microbiome is a combination of microbiota and the theater of the activities, which basically means all the activities, the biochemistry, the nucleic acid exchange, the phages and the viruses, the DNA, and the interaction with the human biological process. The whole thing together is called microbiome as opposed to microbiota as a separate entity. And we can see that from the environment, how all the changes in their structure and the physiology and the resistant mechanism is reaching the clinic. And a numerous human activity is adding to that and making it more and more complicated every day. In this cartoon, you can see starting from the you know, water plant purifications to the farming and animals, all of them are dynamically connected. And the use of medication, for example, here, if you see use of diclofenac in, in the animal um, can lead to the death of the vultures and the fish, you know, the birds, all of us are so much interdependent and connected so whatever we do to the environment, it is coming back to us. 
And the problem is really very, very bad. If you look at some of the data between 1999 and 2000, it's, most certainly it is worse. And you sample water. The water was sampled, 80% of the water uh, from the area, 139 streams and 30 states had all kinds of medications, including antibiotics and antidepressants and hormones and whatnot. And we know the current quality of the sewage treatment plants are not you know, designed to remove the pharmaceuticals from the water. So the water we are drinking has basically all the medications. So whatever prescription you may have, you are actually taking hundreds of additional medication along with your prescription. This is the data from Bangladesh, as you can see here, in, this is 2019, 2015, and 2018. And we look at a couple of organisms, Mastrinobacter and Pseudomonas and Klebsiella. The numbers are very, very disappointing. You see the cholestine sensitivity has in some studies gone down between 40 to 60%. And in a piperacillin tazobactam 38, 42%, amikacin to 30%. And this, this study was, I believe, with Paul and um, uh, uh, Karim was part of the study. There also you see a slightly variation of numbers, but some are between uh, 30 to 60% resistance and is continuously growing. These are all from Bangladesh journals and similar data has been shared by my uh, other speakers today. So how does bacteria, just briefly I'll tell you, i share with you, uh, how does bacteria develop resistance? So you have the, let's say, the penicillins and cephalosporins, the bacteria certainly can cause hydrolysis by the beta-lactamase enzyme. And here we have all kinds of uh, inabivectum and telebactums and salbectums and gyrobactum, all kinds of bactums are coming, are uh, trying to keep pace with this area where the bacteria can release beta lactamase and inactivate. And then of course you have the trans transmit that causes horizontal transfer of the um, resistance to the surrounding organisms. And the antibiotic target site can be modified so that the antibiotic will not be effective. And the antibiotic itself can be modified within the cell by the bacteria. The antibiotic needs to enter into the bacterium. It needs, uses usually the porin channel and the porin channel structure can be altered by the bacteria. And so therefore the entry is interfered. And then of course, bacteria can actively pump out um, the antibiotics to the external environment. So these are all different mechanisms. On the top of that, you may be familiar with the biofilm concept. The bacteria forms a biofilm within which it can live relatively dormant and persist cells where the antibiotic cannot reach. And there are various efforts are being done, including antibiotic impregnated catheters, but we find that they have a very limited role in prevention of the biofilm formations. So all these are different mechanisms. If we are trying to, if you just think about it, right now we have some control on the beta lactamase and the research is going on, but in all other areas, we are almost handicapped. Now, there is still a rationale for empiric antibiotic therapy uh, because the patient came into the emergency room and or to the intensive care, usually in the emergency room for the first time and patient is sick and looks septic. Um, so we have to start antibiotics. And that's generally the rationale behind that is the knowledge of the most likely pathogens, the site of infection, the local resistance patterns, the antibiograms, the patient's underlying risk factors, for Pseudomonas and MRSA and ESBL and so forth, and the best available evidence. Um, and so combining all those things, we come up with some kind of antibiotic regimen to treat the patient as we first encounter. Then of course, our goal should be to narrow it down and stop it as soon as possible based on evidence. That commitment has to be more and more enforced and physicians should voluntarily come forward for that. I probably will not spend much of time on this uh, empiric antibiotic selection because of the time constraint, but I want to briefly just mention, this is from Henry Ford uh, Health System Empiric Antibiotic Guidelines. If you have a you know, patient with a pneumonia from the community and or from the hospital, 
there is a chance there is possibility of a multiple drug resistance, then certainly if the patient has relatively mild disease or on the floor, you can choose combination of ampicillin, sulbactam, jethromax, ceftriaxone, azithromycin, or in place of azithromycin, doxycycline, or moxicycline itself can cover both gram-negative, enteric gram-negative, the common gram-positive, not MRSA, and the anaerobes as well. But the same patient has multiple risk factor or coming down to ICU, settle the com combination will have to change to CPP, vancomycin, and or linajolate, particularly for ICU patients, or piperacillin, tazobactam, vancomycin combination. In case of allergy, then of course you have to choose astronum and other combination. But the point here is that common entry gram negatives, gram positives, and um, atypical organisms, and when it is appropriate, the anaerobes should be taken into consideration. All aspiration is not the same. Every aspiration patient has a different level of risk. Aspiration with the you know dilated esophagus, gastric outlet obstruction is volume of aspiration, particulate, non-particulate aspiration, recent antibiotics, underlying immunological status, area of the lung with abscess, without abscess, empyema or not. All those things can make a difference. But just to give you an idea, that when you see a patient and you know look at the totality of the contest, we have to have an assessment as to what kind of organism are likely to be there and then accordingly choose your antibiotics. So the knowledge of the antibiotics and knowledge of the clinical microbiology uh, is extremely important. I'll just briefly uh, share uh, some basic points here. So what is an MDR organism? MDR organism is a non-susceptibility to three or more from the, you know, different classes of the uh, antimicrobials. On the other hand, extensively drug is basically is non susceptible almost everything except maybe one or two and pan resistance is, is resistant to basically everything. And this is, um, you know, the last two scenarios is increasingly growing as you know, across the world. This is just to give you an example of microbial, uh, microbiome disturbance versus microbiome undisturbed. Is the same patient, if the patient has a lung injury, uh, then you see if, you, if the patient doesn't ha have any lung injury or any other kind of extra stress in the physical system, we do not see, studies doesn't show much of a dysbiosis. But if the system is disturbed, for example, a study in mice was done where Pseudomonas was injected into the blood and healthy mice, no problem. The system you know, responded not so bad. There were slight manifestations of the sepsis and then the sepsis was cleared. The same mice, very similar mice, when the one third of the liver was removed, there was a partial hepatectomy and the sedomon was given overwhelming sepsis and all of them died. So the level of stress in the system, what else is going on? And for this matter, you can extend it to all other comorbidities uh, that, that contributes to the scenario. So in one scenario, you have lots of dysbiosis and the spread of the sepsis and Study actually shows that the lung microbiome itself gets replaced by the um, GI microbiome in the setting of a stress. Somehow the bacteria migrates from the GI tract to the lungs and replaces the normal microbiome. So this is something for us, a very, very interesting observation to take into consideration. And just to share with you how this MDR is growing over time, this is a study on 2013 is published, but here the number it shows is changing from 9.2% to 21.7%. And obviously now the number is much, much higher. So it's basically getting worse. Similarly, carbapenem resistant enterobacteria is also constantly growing and it's not limited to any one country or any particular uh, community it's spreading throughout the world. I will spend a little bit of time on some of the antibodies that I have for this um, escape um, organisms. Tigacycline uh, should not be used for UTI because of poor concentration of the urine and tigacycline resistance is increasing across the globe. Cholestine and polymyxin, I showed you the take in Dhaka data, Bangladeshi data, where you have 30 to 60 percent. Uh, so it is also there is increasing resistance uh, to cholestine and polymyxin uh, for the gram negative organisms. The main difference between cholestin and polymyxin is a single amino acid. Cholestin is actually polymyxin E as opposed to polymyxin B. 
the nephrotoxicity is, uh, is a big concern and neurotoxicity is relatively, even though it's a big concern, but it doesn't seem to be as much of a problem. The fifth generation cephalosporin deceptor lazon and tazobactam has been proven non-inferior in trials with, as compared to meropenem. And now phase three trial is going on. And this particular combination has found, I will show you subsequently the types of different beta lactamases, um, but bottom line is beta lactamase A, B, C, D, that's one of the classifications. And this combination, septolazone and tazobactam, has a way of dealing with you know, A, C, and some of the Bs, um, you know, beta lactamase groups. So because of the extended um, um, effectiveness, this seems to be a very useful antibiotics. And by the way, the B is the metal of beta lactamase, and that is a big challenge. We really don't have much to deal with the metal of beta lactamase. And in Europe, that is rapidly expanding. And so far, we have some research mostly in animals, but metal of beta lactamase, the group B, is, is, a, is, a, is a distinct challenge uh, for the clinicians and scientists. Combination therapy in a very, very severely ill patient has been found to be a little bit more effective, but when there was not very severe illness or um, severe morbidities, uh, then it was not necessarily found to be superior. MRSA <laughs> is growing over, okay. <laughs> MRSA is growing, but the community MRSA seems to be growing more. Actual MRSA as a percentage seems to be going down. I don't want to mention, spend much time on this. Daptomycin and vancomycin, and linezolids, septarolin. This is a new antibiotics uh, from the fifth group for MRSA. But both dapto and linezolid are getting resistance. This I wanted to share with you because we really need this. We have the conventional way of getting a culture that requires, you know, three to four days. Then you have the rapid way that you can give you. A, as within 30 to 40 hours. But right now, this is what technologically, once it becomes much more economical, that what is produced can be done, you know, rapidly have a not nucleic acid amplification through ID, as well as antibiotic resistant gene recognitions and through fish techniques within, you know, few hours, bacterial resistance and ID, both can be detected. And with that, we can select the antibiotic and deescalate accordingly and hopefully help our patients. So I'm going to, so these are the beta lactamase classifications, A, B, C, D in different bacterial groups. And this is what I was mentioning to you, the metal of beta lactamase is a big challenge. We really don't have much to handle that. And the way we are handling beta lactamase, uh, salbactam and clobulinate and avivectam and nacobactam and tazobactam, these EDTA, diferox and desperox, I mean, these are the uh, chemicals that tends to uh, reduce the activity of the bacterial beta lactamases. So they are now being in desperate situations. All those are in research and uh, uh, we'll have some data in the next few years. Septazitive avivectum, particularly for uh, Clipsiella, carbapenemis producing Clipsiella and ESBL has been found to be very, very effective. As you can see here, the combination is compared to an aminoglycosides or cholestine and septazitive avivectum was found to be very effective. Some of the substances being used as the resistance breakers, like essential oils and phenothiazines, most of the research are in the, uh, in the animal kingdom. How do they work? They promote entry of the you know, antibiotics into the cells, blocks the flux mechanism, and the quorum quenches. The, actually, biofilm formation is dependent on the quorum sensing, and the quorum uh, quenching mechanism can be slowed down by some of these chemicals. And also they can change the physiology within the bacterial organisms and slow down the transfer of genes through the plasmid mechanism to the surrounding bacteria. I do not, and this is a very important slide, but I do not have time for that, maybe another day. Now, because of the desperate situation, we are now moving towards the uh, adding the alternative uh, treatment or alternate treatment for, the, for this resistant infection, escape infection in particular. And they, that includes bacteriophages, photodynamic therapy and antibacterial uh, peptides and uh, antibodies and nanoparticles, et cetera. Research is going on mostly in the animal world. There are some case studies in human being with uh, the figs and the fig was actually promising to start with the antibiotic in, but after the invention of antibiotic in 1920s, 
then the fake research went down, but they're coming forward with a lot of promise. Even with all this alternative, I don't have time to show you, Bactria has a very unique way of handling each one of these. For example, in case of photosensitive therapy, photodynamic therapy, you need a photos photosensitive material that has to accumulate within the bacteria, but then Bactria has a way to get it out. Or you use a, you know, monopeptides uh, against the bacteria and it can actually cause, you know, proteolysis of that. And similarly, nanoparticles can be blocked at the level of the cell membrane or cell wall. So all these challenges that you know, we're facing right now and lots of research going on, hopefully we'll have some data, but this clearly indicates that the way we are handling it is wrong. And in order to deal with the escape organism, we have all kinds of different alternative approach right now. Um, and some of them are better than others. I don't think I have time for that. The final point I want to make is the basic knowledge. This is one of the things that I frequently talk about rounding with the fellows and residents. When it's a clinical microbiology, in a particular scenario, what are the likely organisms? The same you know, disease, but different context, different patient, different underlying comorbidities, different organ involved. The knowledge of clinical microbiology and what the antibiotic covers is very, very important. Certainly stewardship is extremely relevant. So timely empiric antibiotic, and based on patient characteristic, the site of infections on the antibiograms, previous history and adequate dosing, de-escalation timely, they're all important. And the final point is if you're not treating an infection, you are giving on, please keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Habibur Rahman Lugu. Um, always fascinated to hear you talk. Bangladesh Jokuni Amra Karu Chikitra Kotha Boli Dakhajai Jishwab Antibiotic Resistant. Akibari Colistin Resistant UTI Monehoi Shab Chaiti Beshi. So thank you for addressing this complex issue. This segment actually was very difficult, handled, handled extremely well by the speakers. I'm going to move on to the panelist. I'm going to ask Dr. Raihan Rabbani to give his um, comments as an, a panelist. Raihan, all through the webinar, Pishon Dhurjodhure Prothom Theke Borshe Acho. We want to hear from you, from your extensive experience in Bangladesh in this perspective. Thank you so much, Raihan. Thank you, madam. I think uh, my job is much more difficult to speak after uh, Haribu Rahman Dulubhai as a panelist. So it's a very difficult job. Anyway, uh, thank you to all the speakers for uh, such a wonderful uh, and uh, enlightening experience uh, today. So for my segment that I am supposed to speak as a panelist, uh, Dr. Soya Tariq Reza, you did a wonderful presentation and you actually uh, pointed out the difficulties in Bangladesh in uh, fungal superinfection. So uh, what I could gather from your case and case presentations that uh, we lack mostly the diagnostics in Bangladesh for fungal superinfections. We now have uh, most of the antifungals, but as uh, the new fungal infection, the mucomycosis and uh, that thing, uh, the amphotericin B, especially the liposomal one, it's so much expensive for the usual people to uh, procure in Bangladesh. So it's very difficult. So we have one patient, one young guy in my hospital now, and uh, we are trying to give him a liposomal amphotericin B and he has to spend like uh, more than one lakh Bangladeshi taka every day for single dose. And it's almost unthinkable for any, any middle-class family or upper middle-class family in Bangladesh. And as you know, that there is no health insurance and it's so difficult. And the supply is also limited in Bangladesh. Uh, coming to Dr. Uh, Lonik Shardar. So it's a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, it showed us that uh, how far behind we are in Bangladesh, especially in terms of the process. Uh, the process, the standard of care and the standard of the system, uh, we need to go a long way a long way. You're from uh, Midford Hospital. So you can just imagine that uh, where we are standing, our nurses uh, and our training. So I, I miss the training in Bangladesh. It's, it's, 
we have so many patients and so many cases in Bangladesh, but the system is not uniform all over the Bangladesh. So that's a big problem. It's not guided by a uni unified system. So we need to come up with that thing. And the things that you uh, told us to do, uh, I of course agree with that, but most of the cases that is being done in the ICU in Bangladesh, not in the emergency. The emergency in Bangladesh, mostly they serve as a triage, not, not an emergency department. And most of the hospital, they lack uh, all the instruments and even all the trained manpowers in Bangladesh. We don't have a fellowship in emergency medicine in Bangladesh. We're trying to come up all those things and hopefully with your help and everything in near future, we'll be uh, doing it in Bangladesh. Uh, for the presentation of uh, Habibur Rahman Lulubhai, it's uh, amazing. It's so interesting. So same with uh, Bangladesh that we don't have a, a separate ID teaching in Bangladesh. So that's a very difficult job for us to uh, come up with all the advances in the ID, ID sector here. So I just want to point out a few things that in Bangladesh, the gram negatives are uh, much more predominant than the gram positives in the ICUs. And in the gram negatives, we have uh, the uh, carbapenem resistant organism, it's more prevalent. You are telling that the empiric regimen. So in my ICU, if the patient is coming from another ICU after a three to five days stay, my empiric regimen starts with a cholestin, not even with a carbapenem. So that's a very difficult thing because the antibiogram shows that when a patient is coming from another ICU, most of them are infected with uh, carbapenem resistant enterobacteria. That's one. The other problem we are facing that the, uh, we have NDM1, mostly NDM1. KPCs are much less common in Bangladesh and in the subcontinent. So that the septazidim avibactam, uh, we don't have it yet in Bangladesh, but it will not be a good use. So we have to use the cholestine and polymyxin most of the time. So I am very afraid that we are seeing some of the cases that's pan-drug resistant, even resistant to cholestine and polymyxins. So uh, I'm not sure if I like catch a sore throat from one of my patients with Klebschella, so I might die from the sore throat, which is resistant to cholestine and polymyxin. So possibly we are heading towards that. And the idea of the microbiota and microbiome, that's a very interesting thing. And uh, I am also very interested with the microbiome here. I think the near future, it will catch much more attention uh, than the antibiotics and all those things. And the ID help we, we need very much in Bangladesh. So when, how to treat the resistant organism, the PK, PD, increasing the dose, uh, we can treat some of the cases uh, with increasing the dose of the carbapenems. So those things need to be circulated, especially amongst us, the consultants, we are uh, dealing with the things. So we need to do that. Do that. And uh, use of MIC in Bangladesh, it's not that much. So how to analyze the MICs, the CLSI guidelines, and how to prescribe the antibiotics depending on that. So if we can get some insight on those things from the, especially the ID physicians like the Bridgeway, it will help us a lot. Thank you. Thank you all for the nice presentation. And thank you, madam. Thank you, Raihan. Ashole Bangladesh, Jeki Prokot Shamusha, Shetato Abushoi, it's noticeable. Tabe Amrakin to Bangladesh, Ogrogoti, Dektepachi, just, just about every day, every week. So, Tariq Reza, Ebong, Raihan, Duijoni, Tomadir Kik to Ashar Alo Dekate Chai. It, it's, it's getting there very slow. So I'm going to invite the next pan, uh, panelist. So I'm going to invite short comments in the order. Um, first from Dr. Tabriz, then from Muhammad Hamidu Zaman Bhai, then from uh, Dr. Tazbirul Islam, and lastly comments from uh, Dr. Habibur Rahman Lulu, if you want to address any of the questions. Thank you, Tabriz, please. Um, choto kure, Thank you. Um, 
So as I said initially, Dr. Rahman is uh, excellent. It's very you know, joyful to just to hear uh, from him. And he was talking about all this um, infectious disease issue. And I was thinking, how does he know? I mean, you know, it's like day to day my work and he already knows all these details. So um, I'm not going to comment about the speakers. That's not supposed to be panelists here, but I agree with uh, Raihan that there is a lot of work need to be done in Bangladesh. In 2008, I was giving a talk in uh, Bardem actually, I think 2007 or 2008. And, uh, you know, I said that at that time, you are doing liver transplant at that time. If you're doing transplant and bone marrow and everything, but you don't have a good infectious disease program and microbiology, molecular biology, actually my uncle, my own uncle, my Amar Mama, India, the liver transplant, Bangladesh, he died from empyma within a couple of months at Bardem. So that is the perspective here. You know, you are advancing in cardiothoracic surgery, cardiology and transplant and everything, but you really don't have the tools. I have to say, all of you are so knowledgeable, Fatima and you and everybody else is so knowledgeable, but with lack of resources, you have just limited options what you can do. That's what it is. So importance is improving the microbiology, culture and sensitivity, MIC data, molecular technology. Those are the important tools. Otherwise, country cannot move forward, even though you're advancing in pulmonary critical care and everything else. In terms of the a couple of points I want to make here, you know, infectious disease is not that simple. What you are seeing, culture and uh, sensitivity, there's a more lot behind that. For example, if you have a citrobacter, um, endocarditis or enterobacter endocarditis, your culture come back with sensitivity to third generation cephalosporin, for example, ceftriaxone. But this patient has brain abscess or you know, um, endocarditis and things like that. You think you can use ceftriaxone, but if you don't have the knowledge of AMP-C, AMP-C is a beta lactamase enzyme, which is basically inducible, means this particular enterobacteristic group, they have this chromosomal Gene, you know, um, yeah, gene that once you give the antibiotic after five to seven days, they produce this high amount of AMC and become resistance. So if you don't have that knowledge, you're going to use that and the patient will fail. That's number one. And there's many other things, in, you know, example like that. Second thing is in terms of the uh, CRE, carbapenem resistant organism in Bangladesh, you know, absolutely. There is most of the organisms are NDM. And as you said, you know, ceftazidim avivectam actually does not work for NDM, period. There is nothing in the beta-lactam, beta-lactam as inhibitor group that works for NDM. So what it does is this NDM, New Delhi metabolic beta-lactam is producing organism. Aisha, I'm going to finish within a minute. So um, <laughs> this NDM has this, um, you know, not only just metal beta lactamase in class B, but it also has other mechanism. For example, a flux pump, for example, there is also ESBL, many of this organism. So if you use ceftazidim, Abibactam, the abibactam portion works for the, the metal of lactamase. However, sorry, uh, the, 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 the abibactam part works for the ESBL, right? But this organism also has metal of lactamase. One of the antibiotic that has shown that works for metal of lactamase is estrionam. Estrionam cannot be broken by this metal of lactamase. So in India, in some cases, I have used that. If I have an NDM, I use ceftazidim abibactam. That is for the ESBL, this many of these bacteria produce, and with that, estrionam. That way, I covered the metal of beta lactamase and I covered the NDM part also. So, there is actually a new drug they're trying to develop called estrionam abibactam. Estrionam is for the metal of beta lactamase, and abibactam is for the ESBL. So, that kind of thing. In, in the last year, I have you know, received from India and from Bangladesh many of this culture and sensitivity. Unfortunately, until you know, these are very expensive drugs, and I'm not sure. So, the point here is your best approach in the short term is prevention. Use antibiotic very judiciously, do not use, and the country needs to take a step that. The government should make a you know, policy. The antibody cannot be prescribed outside the hospital by physician. Otherwise, you cannot differentiate community acquired versus hospital acquired in a Bangladesh setting. Everybody's hospital acquired in Bangladesh because people are coming with multiple antibody at home and other small clinic and so on. By the time you get the patient in the hospital, it's not community acquired. You're seeing pseudomonas pseudom pseudom and asinobacter and so on. With that, I like to say that, yes, there is hope as I have to say that we are going to have more and more exchange and hopefully country will you know, um, go in the right direction. 
Thank you for uh, all the nice presentation. I enjoyed listening to um, every one of you, um, especially Dr. Rahman. I cannot uh, appreciate more by listening to him after all these years. He was my attending for three years. Thank you so much, Tabriz. Ashole Jodi Bangladesh onik rat Jodi Omur Kayamir Ali Flailar Moto, Irat Jodi Shesh Nahuto, the Akshomai to Iti Tante Hobe. We have three more panelists, Dr. Mohammed Hamidu Zaman, who patiently prothom take onik age login kore wait korche. Very short Jodi Apni comment dite paden, followed by Dr. Tazbirul Islam and Dr. Habibur Rahman. Thank you so much, Tabriz. Tomar Tomake ni akshate aronic program kutte hobe. Thank you. Uh, Hamid Bhai to unmute Karim. Thank you very much for inviting me. I really enjoy A to Z and I learn every day something. Uh, and after Habib's lecture, we might think that we, are, we don't know what you're doing. But Bangladesh situation is obvious. And I just saw in the chair one, there is a comment when I said that antibiotics are used all over. She said, not only doctors, the quarks use it. That's what I meant. Bangladesh antibiotics is available in the pharmacy. So that's a different topic that has to be addressed. But what I see in the prospect of Bangladesh, I as I said, we made a lot of progress in critical care, right? We, what I call leapfrog. So I think we'll have a leapfrog in the infectious disease too. And the critical care division will take the lead. Uh, our hospital is at Brookdale. I mean, it's as bad as your Dhaka Medical College, if you people who know about it. It's overloaded, there's no bed, they're poor people. And what I found is that when the patient comes to the emergency room, definitely our ear colleagues do a good job. And by the time they move to the ICU, it's 24 hours or 48 hours later, the multi-organ system. So that's why I created a critical care team. I advise my colleagues in Bangladesh to in, uh, explore this concept. As soon as the patient comes in, you create, take, a, take over that patient right away. They call you for a critical illness, a septic shock, whatever it is, you jump on the patient and as continue the resuscitation that the ear physician ha has done. And it, it created that team to care, take care of all the hospital patients that they like a critical care team taking care of the patients. Okay, so that's one way to improve the quality of care. Now, the what oh, from these talks today, or from the beginning to the resuscitation to the beginning of antibiotics, what do you have to do? We resuscitate, we, now we move to the dynamic phase. It's very easy for the critical care guys to move from static to dynamic. Everybody can get trained in, I know the critical care training is excellent in Bangladesh. You can get certified in your point of care sonogram and continue that. So move from the static to the dynamic phase. And then antibiotics in Bangladesh, there's no way out of it. Actually, this New York State did the study, surviving sepsis, kept in integration by three hours and six hour bundles, how we can tell you. And the, all the, what used to do, all the hospitals in, the, in, in New York State had to follow that bundle. And then the analysis came in. The only thing made difference is not the three hour bundle, not the six hour bundle, is the antibiotic, right antibiotic in the first one hour. So you have no choice just to hit the patients in Bangladesh with the broadest antibiotics or antifungal. But then you need the antibiotic stewardship. You must de-escalate your antibiotics. Otherwise you'll get, get into trouble. So create a antibiotic stewardship in your ICUs in your hospital. And I think that will go away. And then I have a lot of leaders of Bangladesh medicine, Dhaka Middle College principal was here, and the Dhaka Middle College leaders are here. As you created the critical care fellowship, push for your MD in infectious disease. That will be a long way to the development of critical care in Bangladesh. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bhai, for your expert comments. Uh, Dr. Tazbirul Islam, and I'm going to ask Dr. Lunik Shordar to give his comments just a short comment, if you will, at the end. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, Dr. Tazbirul Islam, followed by Dr. Lulu. Short comments, thank you. Assalamualaikum, Aisha. But thank you so much for a wonderful moderation. We're almost three and a half hours uh, long session today. I want to thank all the speakers. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, presentation. I learned a lot, to be honest. So I'm going to just summarize because I really have very much I mean, a real interest in hemodynamics. 
আমি জুনিয়র ডাক্তার যারা আছে যারা শুনছে তাদের জন্য যদি আমি একটু সামারাইজ করি ফর দ্য ফ্লুইড পয়েন্ট অফ ভিউ নাম্বার ওয়ান দ্য ব্যালেন্স ফ্লুইড ইজ ফ্লুইড অফ চয়েস গো বাই দ্য ডাইনামিক ম্যানুভার লাইক ফিএলআর টু অ্যাসেস দ্য ফ্লুইড রেসপন্সিভনেস নট দ্য সিভিপি and number 3 or to fluid ta amra first 24 hours amra positive balance rakhi tarpor kintu amra even balance e chole jay ebong after 3 to 4 days later try to keep it negative balance because the organ doesn't like too much fluid ar uh, vasopressin ni ami bolbo je norepinephrine is the drug of choice that's for sure kintu amra kintu age korta age fluid dite 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 tarpor ditam liver norepinephrine early use of norepinephrine is actually the way to go এবং আর্লি এডিশন অফ ভেসোপ্রেসিন হুইচ ইস টিপিক্যাল সেকেন্ড চয়েস আগে শুরু করে দেওয়া উচিত ইন মাইল টু মডারেট ডোজ নট ইন হাই ডোজ এবং যখন উইন অফ করব ভেসোপ্রেসার্স দ্য ভেসোপ্রেসিন ইজ দ্য লাস্ট ওয়ান টু গো বিকজ ইট প্রিভেন্টস দ্য রিবাউন্ড হাইপোটেনশন সো দ্যাট ইজ অ্যানাদার টেক হোম মেসেজ আর হাইড্রোকার্টিজন যেটা আমরা ইউজ করি স্টেরয়েড ইট শুড বি ইউজ ওয়েন পেশেন্ট ইজ অন টু প্রেসার্স এবং আমরা যখন উইন করব উই ডোন্ট উইন উই জাস্ট টেক ইট অফ ওয়েন দ্য পেশেন্ট ইজ অফ দ্য প্রেসার্স ইট ডোন্ট নিড টু টেপ অর দ্য ডোজ আর আমরা যদি ডিফিকাল্ট কেস যেখানে আমরা ভেসো প্রেসার্স উইন করতে পারছি না দেন উই ক্যান ইউজ মেডোড্রেন মেডোড্রেন কিন্তু হেল্প করে টু উইন অফ দ্য ভেসো প্রেসার্স সো প্লিজ থিঙ্ক অফ মেডোড্রেন এস ওয়াল আর নাম্বার ফোর হচ্ছে আমি বলবো যে এখানে লাস্ট একো যেটা লুনিক বারবাল বললো রলি যে একো ইজ সো ইম্পর্টেন্ট দ্য আলট্রাস ডু দ্য জাস্ট পুট দ্য প্রব অন দ্য চেস্ট লুক অ্যাট দ্য হার্ট ইজ ইট এলভি ডিস ফাংশন অর ইজ হাইপার ডাইনামিক এলভি অর আরভি ডিস ফাংশন অর পেডিকার্ডিয়াল ফিউশন অর আইভিসি সাইজ দ্যাট উইল টেল এক্স্যাক্টলি হোয়াট কাইন্ড অফ শক ইয়ার ডেলেন So actually, I'm going to talk about Lunik. This is his stethoscope, my one as well. I carry a wireless Clarius that I'm a handheld. Uh, I'm going to use it. I mean, I don't use stethoscope at all. Sometimes I use just as a dummy to show the patient is, you know, feel like I'm touching, listening to his chest. There's an old way, but actually I don't listen to anything. I basically rely on moral sound. Or... Uh, আমি অ্যান্টিবায়োটিক নিয়ে আর কিচ্ছু বলবো না দ্যার ইজ তাপ্রিস যাকে আমি আসলে ও আমার ছোট ভাই কিন্তু আমি ওকে গুরু মানি আসলে এবং আমি আই লার্ন সো মাচ ফ্রম তাপ্রিস অল দ্য টাইম অ্যান্ড হি ডাজ সো মাচ ওয়ার্ক ফর বাংলাদেশ এজ ওয়েল ওয়েন এভার আই হ্যাভ প্রবলেম ইফ আই নান্ট টু নো সামথিং আই কল হিম অ্যাবাউট দ্য অ্যান্টিবায়োটিক থিং and uh, i really proud that he is the faculty lead for the ph and id section and i'm pretty sure we'll work together salute to tabriz bhai and habib bhai hamindo jaman bhai tarpor hocche lunik shobai je ache rolly ajke je present kolo bangladesh theke fatima jar fatima raihan father tarpor hocche kani zera hocche young generation frontliner and they will take the flag i'm pretty sure and they already took the flag and they are going forward i salute them and um, and looking forward to work together thank you appa thank you so much for summarizing uh, today's actually entire presentation uh, dr habibur rahman lulu short comment thank you aisha just quickly i'm very happy to uh, see my once bright resident abriz here he continues to shine so brightly uh, it is a great moment um lunik sardar rally you made some wonderful points uh, again time is limited the 30 ml 20 ml business figure that out at the bedside understand the physiology and take action and everybody is different do not think about putting everybody in one shoe everybody has a different shoe number mean different things to everybody a different person CBP of 8 cm, you know that it depends on the vascular tone, depends on the plural pressure, depends on the right ventricular compliance, depends on right ventricular afterload and so many different things. It's not a direct reflection of the interstitial fluid, so therefore capillary perfusion pressure all the time. Figure it out in the totality. Any number is going to fool us unless you want to outsmart that. So that's something to remember. Hemoglobin of 7, yes. transfusion is a transplantation you want to avoid as long as the cardiac output is good heart is not under serious strain oxygen delivery according to the demand which is a dynamic thing not a static thing is assured that is good enough even 6 may be good enough but if you have somebody with the 20% ejection fraction and now having you know come on demand ischemia uh, or angina as a limited cardiac output have a hemoglobin of 7 think about it any number i you know i can talk about each particular number and pick up and talk about it 
for quite some time, but any number we have to be very, very careful. And again, point of care ultrasound is the key, get skilled, but do not be a robot. A number, point of care, you see something, a CMR, see an image, see an echogenicity, look at the patient totality and get back to your applied physiology, bring it to the bedside. That is what's going to tell you what the number means. Without that, we create more problem. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lulu. And um, I'm going to ask Lunik to give just one line comment, if you will. And then audience, I want to invite Korbo, short comment at Juno. Rolly, to me, to my comment, Jodi Dao. Thank you so much. Thank you, Apu. I mean, just not act me 30 seconds, Nibo. Um, your eyes cannot see if your mind doesn't know. I'm talking about not only clinicians, not we are sitting here today, but everyone from the from the society, community, and the whole, uh, the government, the policymakers, everybody needs to know about it. And as a clinician, we have to know between the difference between compensated and decompensated and this transition zone. Um, thank you. But I'm really amazed with Lulu Bhai and others uh, for all these learned uh, comments and everything. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having for joining it, our sessions. Adnan, you are in the um, audience. Tumi Judy Tomar comment da. Professor Fokrun ne sawachen. Tarik Reza, it's very late or chole gache, but he did an outstanding, really heroic job. Kup koti ne takat chilo. Adnan Yusuf, please. Thank you, Appa. Thank you, Appa. Ashole, I'm going to go to the mess management show. Chara diner pranti se se, tapor jokon ami practice session se 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 bojhi. I'm Vachilam Jami Koto Contact Barbo. I'm Sharatin Gunta, which Akbar Nanode, I'm after the Pura Session in China. Abu Shuru Korechen, Abu Said by Abu Said by, you know, the 2016 hour, the ARDS Police and Dakamid Chan Chilam. I'm Sheshuma Messrs. on a Shurute, you know, the Shuru and Tapu Kanis, Duikanis, Kanis Fatima, and the NDV. Waiting for the square sheep, Tarpore, Lunik, among the Said Tarikas, Kutaki, everybody was excellent. Our panel discussion was excellent. I'm going to show Tika to the after JG Mr. Chapsin. JG Amadej improved at academic theater. It's an excellent architect. I'm actually a Niger Bolshina. I was totally misplaced. I'm going to go to Maki and Gondam in Gumia's man. So, two character sessions. I mean, Gelam. Thanks to PHA. Thanks to all the speakers. Thanks to all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adnan. To me, I'm going to give you support. Agamito Korbe, inshallah. Tarik to me, you dig to act line direct a comment, Tite Paro, Amidek Chitomake. Thank you so much for staying up. Thank you, Madam. Ami Akota Boltechai at Oshamano Uddo, Jeta Amade Jara Junior Doctors, Amra Jaran Pashkorechi, Eshate Amade Onekiace. A session on a catch jara hoche amade student, Tara Apnader Kasteke on a kitchen shikche, Amra Shamsham Amrata Dabi Kodi, Apnade Kache, J Apnada Apna Amaderke Evabi Goritulben, Apnader Hate, Amra Jano Shotik, Porta Jan Amra Pai, Amra Jano Shotik, Pothe, Amra Jano Critical Care subject like Agani Nijete Pari, She Loka Apnara Amader Keshop Shumai. Support Shojokita, Ebon Amadeu Podesh, Ebon Shika Prodan Kurwin, Ebon Eta Amade Apna de Kachamade Potasha. Thank you so much, Tari. Kamra Shopshomai to Mother Shatheati, Shudu Amina, all the US faculty. Dr. Roshni Jahan, Amar Junior, Amar very good friend. We are very proud to have you in the audience. To me, act a comment, Korejao. Amijani Onikrat, Dr. Roshni Jahan. She's apart to say, Dr. Fokrun Nisa, um, uh, Amadir, uh, Bishon almost so, I mean, last up and the last year, up to six nine nineteen June, a 
লাস্ট স্যাটারডে যে আপনার ইন্টারন্যাশনাল কনফারেন্স শুরু করেছিলেন ক্রিটিক্যাল কেয়ার মেডিসিনে লাস্টলি আমাকে আপনারা অ্যাড্রেস করছিলেন আমি ছিলাম আপনার ওই যে হিমোডাইনামিক মনিটরিং এ ডক্টর রুমি খান লেকচার আর আদার স্পিকার লার্নেড স্পিকারদের সবই শুনেছি এতে চমৎকার কি বলবো এত ভালো লাগলো আপনার যে বিশেষ করে ডক্টর আয়সা আপনার যে মডারেশনটা চমৎকার আপনি একটা মডারেশন করছেন আর আপনি যে আপনার যে স্পিকার ইউএসএ যে স্পিকার ডেটারডে আমাদের এত এরা এত আমাদের ইয়াঙ্গার জেনারেশন এত সুন্দর ভাবে এই সাবজেক্টকে আগায় নিচ্ছেন আপনার বিদ্যালয় আমি খুব মানে ব্রড ফিল করি আমি আশা করি কি আমরা আরো আরো আমরা ডক্টরদেরকে ইমপ্রেস করতে পারবো কি আরো জয়েন করুক এই প্রোগ্রামে আর ওরা শিখুক এখান থেকে আপনাদের কাছ থেকে আদারওয়াইজ আমি বাংলাদেশে তো আপনারা তো অলরেডি অনেকেই বাংলাদেশ সম্বন্ধে বলেছেন কি আমাদের যে সিনারিও যেটা আছে বিশেষ করে আমাদের ইনফেকশন রেটটা বেশি তারপরে আমাদের ড্রাগস অ্যান্টিবায়োটিক সব রেজিস্টেন্স হয়ে যাচ্ছে এইসব নিয়ে তো চারদিকে প্রবলেম হয়ে আছে জানি না আলটিমেটলি কিভাবে আমরা সারভাইভ করব আশা করি আল্লাহ আছে আল্লাহ আমাদেরকে হেল্প করবে আর হচ্ছে আর কি বলবো তো আমি আর হচ্ছে বেশি আর কিছু বলতে চাই না কারণ সবাই এত ফ্লেক্সিবল এত একমোডেটিভ আই এম রিয়েলি গ্রেটফুল টু ইউ তো এই বলে আমি আজকের শেষ করছি যে আওয়ার অ্যাকশনস ক্যান সেভ থাউজেন্ডস অফ লাইভস তো সবাইকে অসংখ্য ধন্যবাদ আমরা হোপফুলি উইল মিট এগেন ইন দ্য ফিউচার রেসপেক্টেড প্যানেলিস্ট আমার ইউএস কলিগস বাংলাদেশি কলিগস থ্যাংক ইউ এভরিওয়ান দেখা হবে খোদা হাফিজ